Hello and welcome to episode 70 of the Curling Legends podcast. My guest today is Bert Gretzinger. We're part of the Curling Podcast Network. Be sure to check out our other shows from The Hack and Two Girls in a Game. We're excited to announce that we are now part of the Curling News and Sports Illustrated Partnership. Go to thecurlingnews.com for more information. Now on with the show. This is the Curling Legends Podcast, and I am your host, Kevin Palmer. Bert Gretzinger coming up in a moment, but first, just a couple of items. As I mentioned at the top of the show, the Curling Podcast Network is now also part of the Curling News, and you can access our podcast from the curlingnews.com webpage. The Curling News, along with the Hockey News, are now involved with Sports Illustrated, so a lot of exciting things happening in that relationship we want to thank our sponsors, Jet Ice and Hardline Curling, for the continued support they've provided. We haven't taken any sponsorship dollars from them this year. We recognize it's a very strange year, and there's uh, a lot of people out there that are more in need than us at the at the Curling Podcast Network. We would ask, though, that you think of both Jet Ice and Hardline Curling, and also think of organizations in your communities, like a local food bank or the Sandra Schmerler Foundation, and many other groups that you might contribute to. So if you are in a position to do so, rather than read you an advertisement, I'm going to politely remind you to donate to your local charities within your community. Like many curling legends, Bert Gretzinger was born in Manitoba, but it wasn't until his family moved to Calgary and in middle school he first threw a curling rock, and his actual competitive career has taken place within BC, both in the Vancouver area as well as Kelowna. Bert reached his first briar as the young third for Bernie Sparks in 1976. It was in Kelowna that Bert eventually teamed with Rick Folk, reaching the briar yet again in 1989. And then when Pat Ryan moved to Kelowna, Bert was willing to step down to play second. They were joined by Jerry Richard at lead, and that team would make back-to-back briar finals in 93 and 94, winning the briar and worlds in that 1994 season. Bert then would skip his own team into the Briar in 1999 and come very close to qualifying for the Olympics in 2001. And we talk about all of those years, the car spiels, Calcutta's, and we talk about the rock handle controversy at the 1994 Briar that I'm so fascinated with. And Bert also shares some great stories of Bernie Sparks. I'm sure you're going to enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Here is my conversation with Bert Gretzinger. A true BC born and raised. Well, I, wasn't, or no? I wasn't born here. No. I was born in Winnipeg. So, oh, so you're another Manitoban. And the, but I, I, we moved out of there. My parents uh, gave up on mosquitoes and snow uh, when I, at, at an early age. So I ended up the first time I ever curled was actually in Calgary when I was in about grade six. I think. Okay, so you, so you can't. So Manitoba can't claim you as a curler per se. Not or, really. They, no, I we would usually say, like to anyway. I wouldn't say that that's really fair. Wouldn't be fair to because I don't I, I never was a tuck thrower either so <laughs> I didn't really fit the old mode. Now were your parents curlers though? That, oh yeah, yeah. So they that, had well, curled in how, Winnipeg and yeah, that's how you end up curling, right? Your parents have got they want to go down to the curling rink. Uh, you're the kid, you're the anchor, so you got to go. And uh, that's basically you know you end up spinning around on rocks when you're six or seven or eight years old, and then eventually they let you throw the odd one. So yeah, yeah that's pretty young. So you were um, so, but what era would this have been like? Uh, well, let's see if we're not to age myself, but I probably, yeah, I mean, I, I think the first time I threw a rock, I was probably like in 1961 or 62 when I was like 10 years old or something. Yeah. yeah. Good fun. And that was in Calgary. That was the, in Calgary. So yeah. where would that have been at? At the, which club? Ooh, you remember? Westwoods. Okay. Something like that. And then how long did you guys stay in Alberta for? Oh, we were in Alberta for, I think, grade four, five, six, and seven, maybe. Mm-hmm. So four years. Okay. Yeah. So you didn't have a schoolboys experience in Alberta then? No, no not in Alberta. No, no, we, we saved up on that. And I never really took off in curling really until uh, I eliminated some other sports. As I uh, wasn't quite big enough, I found out for some of the other more uh, interesting sports like football. <laughs> so out of the gate, curling wasn't a big love the minute you were out on the ice. It took a little while to... T- oh, yeah, I, I, really, I enjoyed it. It was fun, yeah. but it wasn't really a focus until I got to be a little bit older. I mean, once I eliminated uh, football, baseball, yeah. <laughs> hockey, uh, you know, all those traditional sports that you're, you, but I found I wasn't growing fast enough. I think I got run over in a football game and realized that that was lights out for a reason. Uh, yeah, so it, it was it was good. And then I guess I started playing curling a little more serious when I was around 14 years old, 15 years old, something like that. So mm-hmm. it was, it became a little more of a part of my life. Now, so where were you at that point then? So you'd moved to... 
Uh, we were in uh, basically in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. um, so I started playing seriously at the Arbutus Club. My parents were members there, so the Arbutus Club in Vancouver was there was a lot of good players there. Lyle Dag curled yeah. there. I was going to say, what was the, who were the the BC folks of that era then? That well, the guys that you kind of yeah. uh, Leo Hebert was a real good friend mm -hmm. of my parents, and he was he played third for Lyle Dag when they won the world championship in 1964. So. You kind of get wrapped up in that a little bit, in that culture, and really nice, nice people, like really good people. And uh, so I think that kind of drew people in. And it was a lot more popular back then. There's a lot more juniors, a lot more like in that age group. There was less maybe competition for, for your time. I think now kids have got so many options, and especially uh, in, in British Columbia, there's so many things you can do. Um, so it's a, it's, it's, it was kind of like a golden age for junior curling, if you like. There was all sorts of spiels, and it was a really had a really good social uh, aspect to it. So Lyle would have been so like relative. He's sort of the at that stage, age wise, and Leo and that. They're a bit bit older than you, right? Oh so they, God, yeah. Yes. They'd be uh, quite, but they would be like the the patriarchs of the, uh, Lyle, the club, right? Uh, Lyle unfortunately passed early, but yeah. I, I think he was probably twenty years my senior, something like that. And Leo was the same age as my dad, so that would have been maybe twenty. Six and when, how did they treat the the juniors then at that time? Oh, fabulous! Yeah, well, Lyle was was Lyle was the gentleman, and uh, you know, always a little bit aloof. But he was the skip, right? So in the, you know, but Leo and the, the other guys they played with were just they they were gas. You know, they mm -hmm. you go on the men's night and get to spare for those guys. It kind of got you hooked because they're they're encouraging. They're always encouraging, always helping. It was it was good. Yeah, I always remember that, like hanging around at the Assiniboine in Winnipeg. You'd want to hope that Kerry Burtnick or you know somebody would uh, you get invited on one of the A League yep. teams that you'd hang around. But well, Kerry's see young guy compared to yeah, me at the time. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that shows you that I'm a you know. Yeah, <laughs> I, I might be starting to get the gray, but I'm uh, I'm still a little bit younger. I actually almost uh, just an aside. I almost got the chance to chat with Leo. Apparently, he was quite the talker though. Like oh, in the he, day. oh, he, unbelievable. He was the guy. He, he would remember every shot from every game. If you got him going in, it'd be ashtrays and yeah. knives and forks and salt and pepper shakers all spread around. Yeah, I, I don't think there was a game he played he couldn't remember every shot or at least tell you did, which was really cool. Like really, really, really a lot of fun. Now, were you skipping as a, at the schoolboy age or were you uh, kind of uh, mixing we around? We kind of or? all took turns at being playing different positions. I mean, we, I, I, ended up, I ended up skipping a fair bit, but yeah, you always moved around a little bit. In high school, I actually skipped because there was only, you know, not that many to pick from. So, and that was a schoolboy competitive that, team that type was thing school, where you had to Each school qualify. put together a team and you played off and stuff. Yeah, it was, it was good fun. Grade 11, grade 12, it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was a good way to get out of school a bit early and, <laughs> and go on a couple little trips. And yeah, it was good. Did you ever have, so in the juniors, did, did you have a run at some point or how did you? Oh, I, I think I lost the, we lost the, the BC School Boys Championship yeah. one year. I think we took care of the, the guy we thought we really had to beat. And mm -hmm. then the other guys from the Kootenai somewhere kicked their rats out of us. We had no chance in that game. Sort of putting, uh, you know, thinking it was over when you beat the guy who mm -hmm. was supposed to be mm -hmm. the big competition, walked out and just got slammed. But, you know, yeah, that's a lesson. Yeah, yeah, that does happen. <laughs> Can't get ahead of yourself ever. <laughs> well, that was always the fun part about curling, especially when you were when you were younger, learning how things go, and starting to realize that anybody could beat you, and mm -hmm. if you don't pay attention, because a lot of these guys could play, and just because they didn't go out and spiel a lot or something like that, they would come out of the woodwork and throw a hundred percent at you or ninety five percent at you, and next thing you know, you're uh, mm -hmm. you're going to see event or something, right? <laughs> yeah. So you mentioned you never tuck slide. So then, uh, what did you model your slide after? Did it? Would you just sort of, however you started when you were young? Or well, I, you know, I think I tried fiddling around with the tuck slide for a bit, but I ended up uh, uh, flat foot sliding seemed to be the thing. It was kind of a, a go deal. Leo and Lyle both were flat foot, so we kind of those those were the guys you kind of looked up to then. And also another really good player back then, Glenn Pierce. Uh, he was. Flat foot. So would that, that be was, Brent's dad then? That would Is be that, Brent's yeah. dad. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I ended up playing for him actually, and uh, yeah, for uh, for a year, mm -hmm. maybe two. I can't remember. Yeah, I think it was one, and he cut me. I think ah, something like that. Anyway, but was he know. as mellow and low key as Brent is, or? <laughs> <laughs> he had a certain intensity yeah. about him. Okay, yeah. yeah. By the way, I've only spoken to Brent now on the phone. We didn't manage to get the interview set up, yeah. but uh, we'll get him. Oh, Brent Scott. <laughs> he doesn't yeah. hold back. Yeah. No, no, he doesn't hold back at all. You might have to turn yeah. the volume down maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I like Brent, though. I, I, so some people think he's a little overbearing, but I always just like this competitive spirit. I mean, mm -hmm. sure, everyone's like got carried away, but when I was, he was a lot younger than me. He was in the stands when I was playing with his dad. There's a fair gap there. Yeah. But I played him, when he was playing with Macaulay, we played him back-to-back -back to represent BC at the Briar. We won in 99, and he beat us in 2000. 
And they went on to win the Worlds, and we finished out of the playoffs. So it, probably the wrong team won the first year, too. I don't know. <laughs> but, um, the uh, yeah, I love that kind of intensity. Somebody's got to have it out there. If you're all for dead pounders, you're, so you're it, in yeah, you need a, you Well, need yeah, somebody. every team needs its own kind of mix, right? I think if you yeah. get four hotheads, it doesn't work either. Oh, no, no, you can't have too much of that. Too much of that, and there's, it, it all goes to hell. Well, I think uh, looking back, and I've talked to a few folks like Paul Savage about it, right? If you go back to the that Dream Team squad, right? If I think if you take Harry off off that team and you put in, you know, a fiery front ender, which there was often a, like lead position. A lot of times you might have a, a guy who was really fiery and running around. I think if you put him on that team with Paul and and Eddie, I don't think and Quadja, I don't think that works, right? <laughs> no, nah, I, I I think that Harry was always a good. He was a great guy. I, I mean, I played against those guys enough times, and mm-hmm. Harry was always a stabilizer out there, no matter what. I mean, Johnny was a bit fiery, right? So. Mm-hmm. He needed, yeah. uh, that was a good thing to have. Yeah, they always they used to come out here, right? They do the yeah, the we, BC trips I, and I that. I played them in the yeah. Vernon Carsfield final two years in a row, and uh, they beat us the first year, and we beat them the second year. So they got to drive home one time and walk home the next time. <laughs> well, no, the story was they didn't drive home; they just stayed around in the bar and then sold them after. That's what right? they that did. Was that, the we all yeah. did that. Yeah. If we won a car. Is that they, the way it well, worked? Yeah. Yeah, you, nobody ever really kept the cars. You kind of had to. You kind of <laughs> needed the money back then. You're yeah. all broke, right? So. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was it was good yeah. fun, but yeah, yeah. So back, oh, back to uh, sort of those uh, mentorships. Then was there in the high school stage or at the club? Was there coaching then at all, or anyone that kind of took some of that role on, or was it more you just learned from the Lyle Dags? Yeah, and... you know, you just pick things up as you went and listen yeah. to people. That we, our high school coach, of course, he was a phys ed teacher, mm-hmm. so he's along for the ride, right? I mean, he he kind of read the book and he's going to tell us what to do. But well, we, we've all been playing for two or three or four years, and we kind of know kind of what we want. And he's not to a do. curler. Oh no. no. Oh, no, no. Yeah. but nice guy. Yeah, you know, that type of thing. <laughs> He's the chaperone. Make sure keep you out of too much trouble. Yeah, but you know you, you know you, you you watch guys like Lyle Dag and Leo and those guys and the older guys playing, and that's really how you kind of learned what to do and how to behave and and stuff like that. And yeah, it was great having that. But coaching, there was no real formal coaching until actually Warren and. Jerry Peckham mm-hmm. developed the Curl Canada program. Well, and Jerry was out of BC, right? Yeah, did, you, Jerry, did you know yeah. Jerry at the time? I played against Jerry a few times before he decided it was a career and not a sport. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think he, he did much. He, he did pretty well as a competitor, but I think he did better on the next level. Same mm-hmm. with Warren. Yeah. Uh, they both did great things. Yeah. That uh, Yeah, it was kind of interesting to have that transition. Uh, but the program, the initial program they put together, I think was a great first step towards, um, towards formalizing you know, how people were taught because it was always just like, oh, let's go, out and, you know, start throwing. And I think the best tip I ever got was from one of my girlfriends. And she said, because oh, I was just cranking my intern like crazy. And bless her soul. She came, she said to me one day, she said, why don't you just holding your, try holding your wrist up a little bit and finishing like you're shaking hands with somebody. Well, that sounds interesting. After that, I kind of turned the corner on that turn and kind of made me a more complete player. And that didn't come from anybody, but this mm-hmm. nice woman uh, who's, daughter I was dating at the time and it was just like a tip out of the stance and the way I went oh, yeah. it, was, it was kind of weird right but that's and you didn't marry her with that great advice or that was... uh, well no I couldn't marry the mom that's for sure no. <laughs> that would be awkward yeah. <laughs> no. no it was uh, it was it was interesting it was good fun so you'd pick up tidbits from wherever it, wherever yeah. yeah and you know if you're struggling really I mean there wasn't much you could do except work your way out of it you know and try back in those days too I mean the way you threw was a bit different because there was corn and everything. So everybody had to be positive. Everything's going back. You're kind of putting everything back a little bit. Uh, yeah. And then as, as the game evolves and that, that, that throw isn't always the best throw anymore. So you're free. So you actually, it's kind of interesting from a, from a briar perspective. So you had a big gap between the first two, right? Which is kind of interesting. Well, that, I, was, yeah, I was lucky yeah. enough to play for Bernie Sparks in, that for, okay. in 1976. Well, yeah, so when did, well, yeah, when did Bernie come here, right? Cause it, in, well, he, played, yeah, but and... he started playing in BC before that because he'd been to the Briar with uh, the Giles brothers mm-hmm. before that, who I played against in junior curling all the time. Um, so at that stage, so what was the opportunity? Like, how did that come about then, that first that team? That opportunity to play yeah. with, with Bernie? Yeah. Well, I had played against him in a BC final playing third for Glenn Pierce. And then I basically kind of, you know, Glenn and Glenn, for good reasons, kind of the next year, we kind of was our last year together. We kind of parted ways a little yeah. bit. I was, and there was I an was age the, gap, I right? was the hothead. Eh? And there was there a bit of an odd age yeah, gap? A bit of an age gap, yeah. but that really yeah. didn't, I don't think that really was the bothering point. I mean, I was a little, I was that fiery guy that they didn't need, I think, I threw the odd broom around his stuff. So were you fired off the team or were you trying uh, to, no, or there was Glenn, a, I think Glenn was being the, very polite. The he contract me, expired and I, it wasn't I, renewed or I what? Glenn told me he was going to step back from the game for a year. Oh. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so I went around looking for another team and he okay. turned up with another team. <laughs> so it was, his step back yeah. was short, but fully understandable. I was, I was, I certainly was full value for the dismissal. Um, <laughs> yeah. What's it, funny. Don Bartlett told me about getting fired from Pat, Ryan, Pat Ryan's team. And he goes, I, I absolutely deserved it. <laughs> well, <laughs> that was you interesting. Know, I, mean, yeah. uh, I look back on, you know, stuff and you go like, yeah, that was, a, it was something I learned. Uh, so about two years after that, I was, um, I really was at loose ends. I wasn't, I was, uh, I'd, been, I'd been traveling in Europe. I came back. I didn't play. Were you really focused on curling though? Is it, uh, or was not it so much? Not, yeah. I mean, I kind of, you know, for after that, I kind of backed off a little bit. And then I, you know, I'd done a few things and, and then I was working. And then, so I really didn't, I had my own team. We jacked around a little bit, played some ball and stuff. And then one night in the fall of 75, early in the year, I get a phone call from Bernie and he says, sir, can't make Super League. He'd like me to come out and play. Said, okay, well, why not? So I go to the Capilano Winter Club, I think it was, or wherever it was a Super League type game came out and I was lucky enough. I played, I played really well. God knows why, but anyway, <laughs> maybe it was a, maybe it was a thing. And uh, then he phoned me, phoned me a couple of nights later, says, you're the new third. The other guy's gone. So you didn't know it was a tryout at the time. Know, yeah. I did not know it was a tryout. And he says, the other guy is gone. He says, by the way, do you know anybody who could play lead? So, <laughs> so we went through a couple of leads that fall. We ended up winning, like, I think he won like four or five spiels. And I was on, I was playing with him three of the times and he was just on fire. And yeah, he just fell in love with anybody who had a good outturn. Bernie was all over him. If you could throw an outturn that he liked. So is that before you figured out your intern? <laughs> Oh, long after. But then I didn't get to throw that many interns when I played with him. Okay. But, oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, which was uh, interesting. Really? So he would play the game around outturns? He was a pretty much a one-turn theorist. theorist. Really? Yeah. yeah. He, uh, he, uh, yeah I like I unless that, the ice was forcing the situation. Uh, well, no. Or the yeah, other team. I mean, I was playing third in the Briar in 1976, and I think I was I was like no, almost 90% outturns. Really? Play third. Wow. That's amazing. Uh, the yeah. lead. <laughs> Never saw an intern. <laughs> Keevan Bauer, great guy, good lead, wonderful sweeper. We were corn then. And uh, yeah, he was, uh, him and Al Cook were the front end. And they, Al could, I think Al could throw either turn, but he never got a chance to either. So, <laughs> and that that's an interesting briar. That was the uh, the Newfoundland uh, oh, the Labrador briar, the Macduff briar, that yeah. it's known as in, in Regina. And what, how did you guys, uh, so that was your first experience. What was, well, you remember from it was that. kind of odd because we, uh, Bernie warned us about how the ice would be in the briar because we hadn't been to the briar. And he'd been to many. And right? he'd been oh, to many. Yeah. Oh, it's going to be heavy and stuff. So we went and we practiced throwing hard and hard. And when we stepped out for the first practice shot in Regina, it was like 14 and a half second ice. And uh, that's hog to hog, right? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Which is so like unheard 25, of. 25, like 24 seconds. Unheard of. Yeah. Those days. And suddenly it was like, zoom. <laughs> <laughs> We're looking at each other like, well, I don't know. But the scouting report yeah. doesn't seem to be complete. So anyway, it turned out we played McDuff early and uh, Bernie had a shot to, uh, I think, a, a shot to win the game. It didn't work mm-hmm. out. And and uh, and then we we, had, we ended up losing our first two or th- three, maybe two games anyways. And then uh, that's when Bernie said, that's it. We're getting rid of these BC sweaters. We're going to wear our competitive sweaters. And really? This is a story that not very many people remember. Yeah. But we we marched out with our BC sweaters off on, peeled them down, and peeled them down to these ugly orange and yellow sweaters that we wore mm-hmm. competitively in these in all these cash bills in the in the fall running yeah, out. Yeah, orange and yellow, not two colors that we try well, to put together. Halloween, very often. Yeah. Halloween all day long. It was just they were atrocious. But Bernie felt comfortable with them. And then we went on a tear. And we won like seven or eight, seven games in a row or something, but not mm-hmm. never quite got there. No playoffs that year, so you had to get there right. And I think. I think McDuff finished with two losses. We finished with three with a bunch of other guys. And it's so oddly that game against McDuff that you probably thought early on wasn't a big deal. I mean, it oh, was I think obviously. We thought, I think we thought it was a big deal. In it terms was, of that, well, big deal for you guys to lose, but did you see them as a team that might actually win it then? Not actually, but as it, as it, as it, as turned it, out, as it yeah. went on, as the event went on, Sam Richardson, who I, I got to know fairly well, uh, um, he just led them on. And he uh, he encouraged them and never let them get down. And they were always up. And I mean, they played they played better than everybody else. I mean, they got a couple of breaks where guys missed shots to let them win. But that's why you throw them. They're not made till they get till they stop. <laughs> so it was it was wild. But I don't I, I don't know. I, I think I've I've seen Jack a few times since then. Obviously, over the years, and it, that was it. That was their peak, right? And they they never really re-energized for the world, which was unfortunate because they were better. That they were a better team than what played in that World Championship. But it was such a a rush for them to win the Briar. I mean, 
from Newfoundland. Are you kidding? Incredible. So yeah, well, and I talked with Harvey about that this morning. You know, the '73. We talked about those that that gap, the Labonte curse years, and it's just interesting how each year something weird sort of happened that sort of uh, you know Canada couldn't overcome it. I mean, I I guess I'd read it, but I he explained the story about how you know they were undefeated in the in the in the worlds in Regina, mm-hmm. and the ice maker slept in. Yeah. And they didn't get the ice right for the yeah. finals, and they're playing in water. So. I remember watching that <laughs> final and thinking, what the heck? And, you know, but in those days, arena ice, they didn't have it dialed in quite like they do now yeah. with guys who are professionals. I mean, I remember playing CBC curling, like, on TV with Bernie, and it, the, it, the ice was so watery that if you swept, the rock died. So you had to convince yourself not to sweep if you wanted to go Even further. though you're screaming at you to sweep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But he's the one to point out after one. I said, no, no, no. If I say sweep, don't. I'm no. like, what? <laughs> he's like, I'm, I'm having a hard time with this whole concept. Hey, I don't like to sweep anyway. So yeah. um, so it was, uh, yeah, it was a wild, a wild event. And we we're playing, I think, Bruce Roberts or something from the States. And, uh, yeah. Well, well, oh, yeah. Tell me about the, because I, I hear little snippets about these CBC games and the events and the different, because they had some type of events going back even to the 60s. I mean, Alex oh. Trebek used to do curling, right? For yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. But no. so what was this, uh, what was the... Um, situation that you guys were in through that mid-70s? Well, uh, well, I mean, we played a couple times. The one time when it was in Winnipeg and uh, the old, I guess it was uh, Arena, I don't know. Yeah. And that was where the ice was like really iffy. And I think that was 70, early fall 76 maybe or something like that. I can't remember exactly. And uh, yeah, it was great. I mean, they had good prize money up and everything like that. And, 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 and it was good. It was exciting. It was exposure for the game, which was always good. Um, Personally, my like, I remember watching, I don't know what it's called, Cross Canada Curling or something like that. Merv Mann, who never, ever got to a briar. Mm-hmm. You watch him play Bot Pickering or somebody, or, or, or the Campbells, or somebody out of or some Manitoba, or somebody out of Manitoba. It was always like, you just get wired, right? And then you wonder, why did Merv Mann never go to the briar? Mm-hmm. I mean, the guy was, un- oh, he was like Gary Ross. Like, like, out of Manitoba, you know, yeah. Eventually, you know, it's, it's incredible. But you mm-hmm. watch that stuff, and it kind of motivated you, me anyway, to, to play. But it was interesting stuff. The second time we went, Bernie wasn't that happy. He, he, he picked me up in 1978. We went again to, I think it was the same thing, curling classic, whatever. And, but they decided it would be good if the men and the women played, and we ended up losing to one of the girls' teams. He oh, was not you? happy. Okay, because yeah, they'd done that a few years. <laughs> yeah. In fact, Harvey talked about playing Vera Pezzer in a game that he probably should have lost, I think, in 73. So. Well, we did okay. lose. It was the Pizarro twins, I think. Yeah. And, you know, Bernie mm-hmm. was, uh, we were experimenting with push brooms, and then about, as, as we realized that we were losing, Bernie says, well, we better break out the corn. So now these girls, these poor little girls, and they're nice, nice people in there. We're going to break out the corn. I don't know. This is already embarrassing yeah. enough without breaking out the corn. <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah. we break out the corn and say if something happens and we're looking really good and they, they throw one that looks wide and heavy and it grabs our corn and comes in and makes a perfect shot and we're still losing. <laughs> so <clears throat> there was justice. <laughs> But, you know, they could play. It gets back to what we talked about earlier, about how anybody can beat you. And you, if you're not ready, or if you take somebody too lightly, I mean, you're probably going to get, yeah. you're going to pay for it. <laughs> I mean, really. So you got that taste of the Briar experience. Now, did Why did it BC, take so long? <laughs> well, no, it also seemed like BC in particular, there was a lot of uh, kind of bouncing around a little bit in terms of teams. I mean, I even talked to Bernie a bit about his experience there. Like, it just seemed like, we are you always, Manitoba was a little bit like that too, right? Yeah, well, we're just trying to tweak this or there. Or, yeah. Like, what, see, what would uh, happen over the years? Like, I, I, but See, it? after 76, I moved here. After okay. the Briar, I moved to Kelowna. Yeah. And uh, in the interior, we were always a lot more, there wasn't so much bouncing around. Well, On at that coast, point, you're, you're not going to go play with guys in Vancouver because that's 77, they, they, right? They it's do not, now then. You know, no way you would do it then. And, <laughs> and what brought you here? What was the... Oh, uh, a job. And yeah. my dad bought a business up here and okay. I was tired of what I was doing. And, you know, he convinced the whole family. What, they was, move. what was Kelowna like in 77 then? It must have been. Well, a lot smaller. Yeah, it was a nice, it was a quaint little place. Didn't have this 12 sheet curling club in it at the time then? Or no. was it? Okay. Yeah. No, this was built in not soon, pretty yeah. soon after. Okay. Uh, Early 80s. So there was a curling scene then. Oh, oh the yeah. curling scene was incredible. It was a great social club. It was over by, it was adjacent to the old Memorial Arena here. And it was fantastic. It was a great two levels. The bar was on one level behind three sheets and the other three sheets were on a, you, you were, uh, they were on a, they were on the, all the, all the sheets were on the same level, yeah. but the bar was raised with a low ceiling. You were kind of peering out. And it, it was really kind of neat. The ice was 
not the greatest, but the atmosphere was tremendous. Everybody was friends, and you know that was uh, you know a good party to be had. Usually. But you left you left your Briar team behind. Eh, but yeah, but you know, it's, two yeah. years later, I played him in the final in the provincial final, lost to him two up coming home. We were two up coming home and lost to the. We called him the old man. Mm-hmm. It's a kind of not derogatory, <laughs> Bernie. Sorry. Um, like because respect, because respect, because he's a you know. Oh, he was amazing. Old, but our, our, Wiley veteran. I had a good, I had yeah. a good young team. I inherited a good young team that had been playing together, and I. I, I, so I lost it. I lost. That. So what happened? And so do you remember it specifically then? Oh, yeah. Up? Very specifically. This is a Leo Hebert version. No. Um, yeah, no, we were two up coming home and yeah. he had last rock. And I think we'd given up like one deuce in 22 games. Oh, no. And, yeah. and it took a lot to get out of the province. And uh, so we still had only given up one deuce, uh, but we gave up three. Oh, <laughs> oh no. So, yeah. Yeah. We, you know, we pinned a couple of guards. They got around the corners and. We overswept my first rock, and we were, and I was as bad as the rest of them. I was right behind them, yelling at them, and they were sweeping hard, and we swept right past them when we were trying to corner freeze. And yeah, that's life. You mm-hmm. know, I, it was upsetting then. And then, you know, we lost another pure final in '80, another one in '81 or '82. Well, well, how did it work then? The provincially then, so you like it was regional interior. And, it ended up being the interior against the, against the coast. So, yeah, you'd play. Back so is then. it all those all those games just to get to two teams essentially? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. I think I, we, so we, it's like a, a, a national like, league, American league, almost. Kind well, of we World played Series. back then. Like it was so many more players, so many more teams. I think the first interior Bonspiel I played in was uh, over 100 teams, and which I mean, compared to the MCA, maybe it's not a lot, but that's a lot. Can you can figure how big the province is, and they all drove and came and took time off work to come and play. And but you had seven zone winners, and then there was nine qualifiers out of this Bonspiel which the zone winners could play in and knock out teams. So it was really kind of funky. And uh, then you get down to 16 and then you play double knockout for to one team to go and play the coast team. And they were doing the same thing on the other side. And then did, would you, and then would that be a best of best three? Of three. Yeah. So yeah. we drove all the way from Prince George that year. We drove down to Vancouver because it started the next day or two days later. Oh, so right after the right away. Plane? Oh, right away. Yeah. We just drove straight down there. And, uh, yeah, I think we lost the first game by one and we beat him in the second game by one. And then the the third game was history. But I mean, that's just, you know, it was that. And we did the same by the time 80 came along or 81, there was an 18 provincial final and it had changed. And they, they, they went through various single knockout, or double knockout and triple mm-hmm. knockout scenarios, but it became different after that and, and better. Now, did you, I mean, you had a lot of gap between playing with Rick then and getting back to the Briar in 89, but did you have a lot of appearances then? You'd usually make that provincial or was... Yeah, we played the provincial quite often. And, of I time. mean, you know, we lost uh, three or four finals, but it was just one of those things. And, you know, I was doing... Well, we were doing well in the cash field circuit, no problem. Mm-hmm. Winning, winning did you travel of, a bit too then from the cash field side? I mean, there was a lot in BC alone, right? Yeah, and, we played We played a lot. I mean, not compared to some of the teams they play now, but we would play... Would you go out to Winnipeg or Thunder uh, Bay? Or yeah, that, or we, would you, we would go yeah. out there once in a while. Um, typically we would start in Vernon and then Kamloops and then maybe Kelowna had a spiel and Prince George had a spiel and then sneak out to Calgary and go down to Abbotsford. There was a spiel. Always tried to get to the best borough in Saskatoon. Well, you mentioned uh, you won the cars. So the which squad was that then that you won the cars with that? Was, well, in 80, yeah, was that we a- won the cars in Vernon in 81 and 83 with the same team, um, which was me and Glenn Jackson, who used to play for Paul Gausel mm-hmm. and Rob Kofsky and uh, Ron Steinhauer. Okay. And, and was that more of a spiel team then, or was that your... That was our this, team. Your regular team. Yeah, yeah. We, that, we lost the final with that team too. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but then, you know, we played, we won, we beat, this is the irony of, of curling. We, the first car spiel we won in 81, who did we beat in the final? Bernie Sparks. And the guy who, you know, who I played with and I and I loved and learned so much from and, and who had beaten me in the in the provincial final, beating our team in 78, different team. And uh, and the irony and the total irony is, is he had us wired. We should never have won that game. We stole 9, 10, and 11, the extra oh, cars. Oh, jeez, really? After yeah. he... Still, after he scored three to beat us to go to the yeah. bar. So I guess maybe it all evens out <laughs> yeah. at some point. Well, in those car spiels, like they would get big fans, oh, right? And these fans, were events. But, but yeah. great teams. Yeah, and great 30, teams. 32 yeah. great teams. I mean, there, there'd be a few club teams who qualified or whatever, but, you know, there'd be the Finks and the Pickerings and the North Coast. And I mean, they were... They were incredible events. They were to win one was was really exciting for you know you really like the slams of the day if you think about it right because oh, yeah. I, because that was a good return for your investment right because oh, a lot of times you're playing a lot of times you might be playing a bond spiel where you know a thousand bucks is a is a nice prize or well, we a few were, thousand 
And all of a sudden I mean, you're getting cars. Uh, now the cars weren't worth that much in the seventies, but still it was, you know, if you take seventies dollars, but at the dollars, yeah. If you take seventies dollars and apply them to four cars, which we sold between for between five and thousand, six thousand dollars each. And what's a what's a nineteen seventy dollar a nineteen eighty one dollar? Oh, I know. I've, I've often said that actually the kind of that late seventies was might have been the heyday of curling financially. Late as 70s, much as it's early early eighties, yeah, there was lots of good players, lots of uh, lots of good prizes. I mean, we were lucky enough to win three sets of cars. In a short span. No, you mentioned that you played with Glenn for a bit. Did you ever have to play Galzel's rink then in the seventies? Do you remember when he was on the? Oh yeah, we played with that junior rink. Well, yeah, we played again. That's when Bernie, Bernie. I was playing with Bernie then. We played Paul and those guys, and 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 Galzel, Galzel's team was they were just sneaking by everything, and we're we're still swinging corn with corn, yeah. And and Bernie says to me, he says, "How can those guys keep doing that?" <laughs> and I, I said, "Well." If I was you, I'd look at what we're sleeping with, but you know, <laughs> they're, they're yeah. just, they were the best, right? They could make, they were, they were great players and they dialed in the push brooms first and. And they knew how to use them. Oh, exactly. You, it sounds like I mean. you guys were. They the, dialed it, they dialed it in. It took us until Glenn came and moved out here and started playing with me. I don't think we really had appreciation for, for what, you, you know, the sweeping. Like how to use them. Uh, yeah, specifically. The I think yeah. Bernie even mentioned that to me when I asked him about it, that. Even though we used them, we didn't. We had to pick up on how to use them. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was a different technique, a different science, different, different art form. Well, okay. So you're playing with Glenn. Did he ever have some good Galzel stories? And then, like, was uh, <laughs> I mean, but, you know, they, we, everybody was young then. You got to remember, like, uh, this is a long time ago, and Glenn, Glenn was younger than me, and so yeah. was Paul and those guys. But yeah, but Glenn was a, a great player and a good friend of Paul's, and I'm sure we shouldn't be telling any stories out of school. Well, so Paul already uh, told lots of good ones if you listen to that good. podcast. Well, Paul, yeah, he, sure, I don't think I can elaborate on anything. I got it. Paul. No, I know. He, I got to do a part two with him. Well, no, I'm wondering just in terms of playing for Paul because he could be very boisterous, right? And there's some great stories well, about Paul him. Paul was very just hollering at his guys. Oh, he'd holler yeah. and scream, yeah. and he was the fiery guy. On yeah. that team. <laughs> so now, had you toned down a bit by then, or when you were skipping, were you a little more? Kinda... Uh, you know, I, I think by the mid '80s, I toned down my act a little bit. Yeah, I wasn't quite as crazy, but I mean, I was. And by the early 80s, when I was skipping, that was better. Before that, maybe not quite so much. But. Well, it's always tough because, you know, sometimes it's like you want to let your team have it for their sweeping, but oh, then, you know, maybe yeah, I made or a shot. But, you know, no one ever missed on purpose, right? I made, so I made some to, bad mistakes yeah. in, in, in handling my, my personnel at some times, you know, calling them out in the wrong times and stuff. But I think hopefully they've forgiven me, those now, people. Did you, like, did you like skipping? Like you enjoyed having that last shot? Like some guys, even very successful skips, didn't necessarily like it as much. I know Paul Savage loved playing third. Well, you know, I, I really, uh, I, I always thought I was a more natural third. Uh, Even when you were skipping? Well, but then when I moved and started skipping again, when I moved up here, I was young and a little more fearless. And I think as I grew older, I, I became, um, what's the right word, a little more fearful. Uh, and mm -hmm. I was, by the, time Rick, by the time Rick Folk moved to town, I was ready to play third. Because I, you know, I've been skipping for ten years with lots of success at various levels. Well, part of it too is you start to build up a bit of almost like um, uh, scar tissue, right? Oh yeah, you, you can see things differently. Say bad things seem like they might be more easy to do because mm -hmm. because <laughs> it's happened so many times, right? Well, Nick, you've seen yeah. it, but yeah, I know. I, I was ready for I was ready for a change when Rick moved here in '88. I I was ready for a change, and I was lucky lucky enough that he, you know, he. Got together with us, with me and Rob Kosky and uh, and Ron. And uh, but he didn't try to change you to corn brooms at that point, though, right? Because <laughs> or, or uh, no, was it discussed? We still slid with one, but no, okay. we were no, wasn't we discussed. Were, we were pushers by then. He was, yeah, no, Rick was. We were, well, that was that era though, where you could sort of bring out different brooms, right? And, yeah, like, you, you could bring them out, but I mean, the mid '80s was probably the worst for that. By then, it was kind of getting like, really, you're doing that, so it was kind of had a stigma attached to it by then. Yeah, guys did it, but you know, you kind of frowned on them because they could literally ice all they wanted. But if you're using your push brooms, right, it's not bothering you. <laughs> so, well, yeah, I remember. Well, Rick mentioned that uh, that he actually recalled that they he thought they were using corn brooms right up until he left Saskatchewan. Almost, oh yeah, pretty close. Some of them were. Which oh, I was remember pretty playing, rare at that point. I remember yeah. playing some of the teams uh, from Saskatchewan into the late '80s, like Al Lind and, mm -hmm. and guys. And they were using corn right to the end, and they, they but they'd use clean corn. They would they, not the stuff that exploded. So it wasn't horrible. It was more manly, that's for sure. So you know, and they were farmers, and they were great guys. So they're they're good with it, right? So. But you even mentioned before moving from skip to third, you were probably very happy to say, "No, I'm not using one of those ever again. That's yeah. never going to happen." <laughs> but, yeah, no, that's for sure. I just uh, in the in the 1976 briar when I was playing with Bernie, there was they were 12 end games then, mm -hmm. and we went 14 ends in one game, and against. The, Alberta, I think, and then uh, we played a long game against the Blonde from Manitoba, 
And there's a picture in the paper of the St. John's ambulance guys wrapping my hands because they were bleeding. Now, most people say it's because I never swept properly, which I may be right. Well, but, did you sweep with the overhand <laughs> grip or the underhand? I was, I was an overhander. <laughs> so, and not a very good one, I don't think. So I, I kept grabbing all the brooms that Al Cook and Keevan Barr would throw out. Uh -huh. I was like, there's nothing wrong with that. And I grabbed <laughs> that. You know, I mean, they're they, they killing themselves laughing. But anyway, so it was, uh, yeah, it was it was interesting. But I, I, I'm uh, I, I was a big advocate of the push broom after that. Because uh, I did get to do a little bit of sweeping later on. You returned in '89. Now, was that a uh, did that team sort of gel come together? Was there any tense we were moments? Or? Like, uh, you know, we uh, ended up. Rick and I got along very well on the ice, and I'd always played with Rob quite a bit. Um, we had one or two years when we didn't play together, and then our lead was ended up being Doug Smith, and our fifth man ended up being Ron Steinauer, who was mm -hmm. the guy who I played with a lot. I think that's how it went. Yeah, but yeah. Anyway, so it was really quite easy because yeah. Rob played second. Before, and he was from Saskatchewan, so he knew Rick. And Rick and I knew each other from playing against each other and, and other things um, through the years, and uh, it, it fit pretty good. Uh, I don't remember how we did cash bill wise but he was just getting the business going, and I was still, you know, I was working. I, mean, I don't think we played a lot outside, but when we got to the provincials, uh, we got rolling pretty good, and, you know, things were going our way, and we got to the Briar, things went well, and then we ended up playing Pat in the final, and... You know, it was uh, it was interesting. So at some point you go, well, maybe I shouldn't have been beating my head with all the skipping all these years. I just needed yeah. to find someone like Rick and we just, yeah, but it, just it, seemed it, easy. It goes full circle because I go back to skipping after. Right? So that must have been an interesting experience to have a 13-year gap between your briars. Just at that point, seeing what the event was like. Because totally now it's a Labatt's event. Oh, yeah. It's very different. Like what do you, what was, do you recall kind of the... Well, it went from lots of free cigarettes to lots of free beer. Yeah. I'll got. <laughs> so it was kind of <laughs> yeah. Well, in '89, where was it? Where was the the '89 Briar? That Saskatoon. was Saskatoon. Saskatoon. Okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was a, it was a really, uh, it was a golden time for Briars because they, they the the CCA and the, the the committees and everything had enough money and they you you know your wives you got drivers and everything was it was different than it is now, um, more social. I think in a lot for, especially for the contingent around you. And, and Rick was kind of going home. Yeah, Rick was going home. That, yeah. that Briar in particular was was yeah. crazy because Rick was, I, I can't even remember who the Saskatchewan guy was. I know I would remember giving an opportunity, but but he was like the hometown mm -hmm. team. I didn't know if I was playing for BC or Saskatchewan because, you know, he was well loved in Saskatchewan and mm -hmm. they were, you know, we were, we had a lot of fans. So it was it was pretty cool. Well, even Rick would say maybe not loved by all because he had been a politician. So well, yeah, I, <laughs> I would say that's why he had to leave the cross. That's what he that's, <laughs> that's what he said too. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and in terms of uh, Rick skipping, you just sort of let him because you've been skipping for a lot of years. You just sort of let him call the game, and if he asked your input or was you there know, ever any... uh, you know I th I think the most important thing for for me going going along and changing positions here and there is you have to adapt. And uh, Rick's a general. Rick's a general and. And I was uh, at a point in my in my career where I didn't mind being a follower if I had faith, and I had the faith. And uh, we very seldom disagreed on anything except when who hit the broom and who didn't. I think we went most of that year without either of us hitting the broom, <laughs> according to what we told one another at the other end. So yeah. he'd come down and say, and he'd go, and I, did I, uh, and you'd the, say, oh, you're a little wide. He goes, yeah. no, I think I was right on. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, we had that going all year. It was became a bit of a, oh no, you're just a hair on the full side, or blah blah blah. And so, so it was. It was kind of a, like a running thing with us. I don't think either of us really hit the broom all year, but you know, it was uh, it was a good target to have at the other end. But Did you guys, I, I mean, I read you guys had a couple of uh, which was it was I can't remember where it was in the Briar book in the Briar book in the 80, okay eighty nine Briar uh, that was Oris Melischuk made his return. So talking about Briar gaps, right seventy two to eighty nine, and uh, the story was that there was a uh, was it a burnt rock? Yeah. With a with a uh, explain that story. Well. I mean, the short the short version is. Well, we can have a long version too. Uh, the thing, the thing. Okay, <laughs> it was a tough end. The game was close. I don't remember the score. Uh, I think maybe tied or maybe we were one up. And uh, I think Johnny was coming around a guard, not Orist. It was like on his last shot. And uh, you sack us. You sack us. Yeah. Us, yeah. And uh, they, uh, as it was going to to the guard, they burnt the guard, and it looked. To us, like it was going to hit the yeah. guard, and it, and it looked to Orist, of course, like it was getting by. <laughs> so it didn't go smoothly. Yeah, <laughs> we had to get a bunch of officials mm -hmm. had to come out and everything. And you know, Rick Rick was a sticker for rules, and so was I. I mean, burnt is burnt. I mean, really. And um, so the the options were 
you know, they're, they're put everything back and their rock comes out of play. And that was kind of, that's what we did. So mm-hmm. there was a long discussion until we got to that point. Mm-hmm. Morris was going all excited. And then so... Well, it's the point. Like, he, they weren't disputing that, that uh, it was, I think it was higher. They know that, they burnt the guard. They, know they, they knew they burnt the guard. Tapped the they, guard. But they're yelling that they're going to get by. And we're going like, well, why are you sweeping so hard? <laughs> you know, so it was, mm-hmm. it was really, but I mean, legally. And I, th- and I think actually the reality was that it, it probably was going to tick. But you can't guess that one. So, so was there, after, was there heated words or uh, what? Oh, there was a few heated words, not between teams, between officials and us. Okay. And then, and then the teams maybe had a, a small exchange because we made our, the decision was made, the referee told, told us everything. So then Rick says, okay, well you go put them all back. Me. Uh-huh. Cause it got it by the garden and started moving rocks around. Right. So I got to say, what do you mean me? I got to go. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I know and then you got to try to remember where they are. Well, even, right? yeah, or- we had a pretty good idea and they had cameras and shit, but anyway, what did we got? To, but I think Oris thought I was going out to, to just put the guard back. Oh, um, that okay. it all started with his rock coming off. Well, and now then, you're putting uh, everything back to where it was. Yeah. Putting everything back yeah. to where it was and it's our turn. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there was some hard vibes about that, but we got <laughs> over it. Everybody got over it. I was getting booed from the crowd. Really? Oh, well, sure. There's oh, Manitoba geez. fans there. Yeah, yeah, yeah quite a few, I'm politically, sure. Rick was was brilliant. Why would he do it when he could send yeah. me out to do it? <laughs> well, and I, I remember that team because Orist had, there was a lot of fans pulling for Orist as a comeback story and everything else out of Manitoba at the time. And, uh, Certainly one of the great characters of the game. A good but, guy, but, too. But, not, yeah. but certainly guys that weren't going to back down, right? Oh, no. E- even if they're in the wrong or... Well, they had they yeah. had Usakas, they had Heirich, and uh, oh, they had a, a lot of fire on. Remember we were talking about how you, all four players? <laughs> yeah, they had, they had a lot going on there, <laughs> but they could play. Yeah. They could still play. Yeah, probably his son, Sean, at lead was probably the more of the low key guy, which is funny because he's, he's, you know, he's descended from the tree, but... But I, but I think, I mean, he kind of had to take a back seat to Oris. Let's yeah. face it. I mean, Oris was, yeah. a, Oris was a bit of a legend. I mean, no question about it. Right. So it was, it was cool. It was a difficult situation, but you know, that was, that's just the way it had to be. I mean, the, the rules are different. And, um, oh yeah. So there's another, another burn rock story I want to ask you about then, which is where you, something about a stick of gum, maybe not at that briar, but I, I don't oh, remember, recall I, where it I occurred. Think there, was, or, there was a, uh, we were playing in a cash field somewhere and there's, some guy was sweeping, the opponent was sweeping a rock. Okay. And some, a, a stick of gum popped out of his, out of his, out of his pocket and landed on the rock. And theoretically it's burnt, right? And it, I guess we didn't really, we, in the end, we never made us think about it. Oh, you didn't? Okay. No. Well, the way, I oh, mean, I, I, there was, there, 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 I think that that story might have got expanded upon, but in the end it was just like Rick and I kind of went, mm, yeah, forget it. <laughs> well, okay. Cause I think that, well, the way, the way I read about it and I can't remember if it was in Bob Weeks book or one of the books, but it was just something like, well, maybe Rick was annoyed with you. And maybe, maybe again, he sort of wanted I to sit on the Rick sidelines. Why don't be be you go maybe. be the bad guy? Or it's like, well, Rick, why don't you be the bad guy? <laughs> I don't know. No, I would never have said that to way. We talked about it. I don't think there was ever any, there was never any hard lines between us. We were just thinking, well, he knows he burned it. He should take it off. Right. And that, in that day, and he, mm-hmm. it was, it should come off. But yeah. yeah, it would have been kind of lame to go after him on that. But you know, and that's really shifted. It was interesting you say that because one of the things I talked to Harvey Mazinki about today, and I didn't realize it, he's the guy that rewrote the rule on the burnt stone. Oh, maybe. Yeah. And Harvey wrote it. He explained it all, how it all took place. Back in the day, the burning of the stone was really used as a, a technique to stop a bad shot, right? Could be. He mentioned names of people that he who who had tried this back in the day and pretty, would use pretty it. Pretty sure it wasn't my name. And no, no, well, I'm going. I'm going way way back. <laughs> no, right, mostly can't. Saskatchewan. Um, but what's interesting is he rewrote the rule. But what I kind of love about it, it's very much a rule now that puts the onus on the non-offending team. So now all of a sudden you're the non-offending team, and now everyone's watching you. Yeah. If you're unsportsmanlike, yeah. now maybe public, you might still remove the stone, but like happened to Rachel Holman in the Olympics is now Your public options. opinion shifts, which really doesn't make sense because the early adoptions of the rule, like for many years, the way the rule was, is you burn it, it's gone. There's yeah. no question. Yeah. And okay. now it's become, well, we're not sure. And maybe that's in, well, unsportsmanlike. The non, I think the non-offending team, having the onus on the non-offending team is almost as bad as the other way around because yeah. you can interpret where the rocks are going any way you like. Yeah. Uh, it's not a perfect rule. It would be a perfect rule if everybody was honorable. And But the hard one was always when you hit a guard, it's, it's not a running stone. You're hitting a stationary stone. And then like that discussion with Orist in the 89 Briar, was it going to hit the guard or not? Well, yeah. 
He thinks not, and he's the offending team. <laughs> we're, not, we're the non-offending team, so you go like, yeah. Or the other yeah. argument is, well, if it was going to hit the guard, well, shouldn't you move the guards and split them out, and why take the rock off completely? Because technically, you didn't hit the moving stone; you hit the non-moving stone, right? So it's that becomes interesting. But, yeah, it's it's a very difficult deflection thing. I, I think if everybody would just, I, I very seldom, personally, ever experience a fact where somebody burnt a rock on purpose. I, I don't think I, I, I would say I would be hard pressed unless somebody did it to me and I didn't notice notice it. it. Uh, I would say that it was maybe a rule that had to be addressed, but uh, I think Rick might agree with me here. Burnt is burnt, you know, and mm -hmm. unfortunately there's nothing you do about the, the when you burn a, a stationary stone, that's really the nebulous thing that happened in that briar, right? To me, I think it's a great rule because it makes curling more interesting. No one's going to ask Bill Belichick if, uh, you know, <laughs> hey, it was, was that pass interference on your receiver? Because yeah. every single time he's going to say yes. But yeah. in this case, ask the non-offending team, hey, what happened? How, how do you want to treat that? I mean, that's... I think it's I think it's interesting. It puts, oh, it's great. You know, and and uh, so it's a t it's a difficult position for some. Oh. I mean, Rachel Holman was in a difficult position. Yep. She's already struggling at the at the Olympics. Mm. It's an important game. I mean, it says off, and uh, Mike and Joan gave her a little grief over it. It might not have been the right move, of, but well, I I don't yeah, know. But I'm, she's I'm not argue I, that. I, you know, I, it's 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 a million ways to look at. It. I mean, I I think I think the more the more credible problem through time was the sweeping issues. All the changes in sweeping and what's right, what's legal, what's legal, what's not legal, what you can do. I think they might have finally got to the right answer, uh, <laughs> but I still think that they should have to sweep across the face of the rock. And uh, maybe that's old school thinking, but yeah. they don't. Part of it is they want to make technology as limited as possible so that they don't have to worry about, you know, the specifics. Yeah, which but maybe... the, the shared technology is fine, but I mean, the technique of sweeping corners and everything, that was a big uproar. That's what. Did you guys pick up on that? Like that was done in the 80s when the, the brooms started? Push yeah. brooms? Oh, absolutely. Even though it seems like no one really understood exactly even with, even, how it worked. Know, there was guys who, <laughs> who were good enough with corn that they could sweep off one side or the other. I, uh, yeah, I've heard of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, I mean, it's always been an issue and it's difficult, but at least they've got. They've, uh, for the competitive players, at least, they've got, okay, you're all using the same broom. You're going to start with this broom. You're going to finish with this broom. Perfect. That takes care of a lot of the stuff because there was too much that throwing the brooms back and forth mm -hmm. and getting new heads. And we were bad at that. In the, in the, when I went back to Skipping after playing with Rick and Pat, we went to Hammers and we were switching heads every second end. Oh, really? Well, it was nothing wrong with it. Kept fresh heads on the ice. And and you could tell that they were having an impact well, they, keeping the oh yeah greater fresh, and, anybody who ever used any of those synthetic rooms will tell you that they had a certain amount of life in it depending on ice conditions and my guys might go through three or four heads a game you know depending on what you're doing and uh, but that was the rule we didn't there was nothing to stop in this so we did and then as it evolved we and my we found out we didn't really like those rooms that much and as technology improved there was better synthetics available mm -hmm. so it kind of changed out right but yeah so it was there to do so. We did it. So Pat comes into town, and I think you guys played against them the first year he came into town, or when did it happen? That uh, for, how did that all? Yeah, he did. He, he in ninety in ninety he came to town. Yeah, because he beat us in the bar final in eighty nine, and they went and they won their worlds, and then he took a job here. It's like say, wait, so you beat us, and then you got to come here and, <laughs> and, and oh, can we talk about that final again for a second? Because that was the three two final, right? That was uh, three two four two whatever. It was. Well, well, no, it was yeah, it was uh, three two. Okay. And that was sort of the height of the Ryan Express. And as well, someone we who grew up, we weren't shy either. We could about bang. Him, yeah. <laughs> well, but what, I mean, as a player, what do you remember about that experience in that game? Obviously, you just want to win. What do I remember takes... about that game? There's about three specific shots that I remember about that game. In about the second end or, or, or whatever, Pat made a, he was trying a, uh, some, some type of shot that he didn't make, but he made another shot that was better. Uh, he ended up making a double double and rolled out for the blank instead of it looked like he was trying to do this to stick for one but anyway that's okay so that was a bit of a turning point and then uh the next time we came that direction and about the fourth end i buried one around a corner and then i think i think furby wired one right on the corner of me and then we tried to run the guard back missed and they ended up getting reduced and that put him up too and that was kind of got the kicker and then the very next end in the fifth end we got him in a lot of trouble and pat made some circus shot and took about three of ours out and that was our last sniff yeah. After that, it was like, ooh, who turned out the lights? Because we ended up having to take one, and it got it got ugly after that. You had to sense too, particularly the way that the style of the game was then. That it's it's exciting because there's like you say, there's you can pinpoint three moments, but at the same time, the game itself, there's not a lot of rocks in play. It well, starts to get yeah, to be... but the other the other moment in that game was we knew they had their little team meeting and they were going to do this and do that, and we knew they were going to try and run us down. I mean, that's fair enough. They had hammer and they were one up. 
uh, why wouldn't they? <laughs> I mean, we if we could have done it to them, we probably would have given it a go. But it, we knew they were pretty committed to it. In uh, I think it was the ninth end, the ninth end, uh, my first rock. We had talked about maybe hogging one on purpose to see what they would do. And then I don't know if I really hogged it on purpose, but I did get over to Hogline, and they had another team meeting. And, and Pat, Rick and I were looking like, well, maybe they'll throw one in play here somewhere. Who knows? You know, maybe we could try it. something good might happen. Wheeled that through. <laughs> so okay, so this is definitely a lot over then. We're not. There was they had a little quick discussion, and then uh, that was it. Mm -hmm. So and you know the rest we just we threw up another ten guards, and uh, they were all gone. And then yeah, we ended up losing. And I think that that had a lot to do with oh yeah, the with, ushering with in of the, the free guard yeah. zone. And well, did you guys play in the uh, the Moncton Spiel? Did you guys play in the, it? Yep. Do you remember that the, the, the Moncton one hundred that was would had the yeah we played with the, with me and Rick and uh, and Rob and, and Doug yeah. What did you think of the time at that? I, idea th I thought it was fun. It was good. It was different. I mean, we mm -hmm. didn't play very well, but that's okay. I mean, that's the way it is, right? It was a little different. You know, any any time I played out in the Maritimes on arena ice, I've always found that the arena has never been the, the mm -hmm. best for the whole event. But did you think that okay, something has to change or the rule something's going to happen? Well, here I, there. I think there was no doubt that something was going to change. I'd seen a lot of things that Eddie Luke, which had devised, you know, putting rocks in play, and which they use some of his ideas now in that the, yeah. the mixed doubles and stuff like that. Some of his ideas have actually, if you look back far enough, uh, good for him because he had some really good good thoughts, and and that was fine too, uh, and it was a precursor. But I think what really killed it in the end was mm -hmm. uh, the, the Briar Finals from about 91 through to 94 were all basically one-shot ball games. The first team that got 2-1 uh, because all the teams were that good and the ice was that much better. Going back years before that, the ice wasn't that good. It was really hard to run a team out. But now, as the ice conditions got conditions, better and better, push, and better brooms. push brooms and teams got better at peeling because it was easier and the runbacks became a bit easier and it was uh, it was coming. And it was really kind of interesting the way it all worked because in 93 when we played, there was still a fair number of rocks in play because it was the types of teams that were there. Even though that was still the year, just the year before free, the free guard zone came in, right? That 92, 93 season. Yeah, there was still a fair number of rocks. We ended up playing Russ in, in, in mm -hmm. the final. And now was that the first year of that team then, or that was the no? Second we year? played we played it together in ninety one and ninety two and never got out. And then ninety three, ninety four, ninety five, we went to those three briars. Were you perfectly happy to say, okay, I'll play second? Like oh, was sure. there there was no I saw an opportunity to win. Yeah, and the only the only downside was I had to do a little sweeping, which is okay. Nobody you ever couldn't convince Pat to, to sweep more, and then you just hold a broom in the house or something, or you didn't talk about that. Uh, the, the, <laughs> the, the joke is really nobody ever really understood how good a player Jerry Richard was because really. I was his main sweeper, <laughs> and Pat was out looking for logs. Oh, was <laughs> anything big out there I can get? Maybe a gum wrapper or something. He was quite a ways ahead of me, anyway. And, well, because uh, Pat used to be a, quite a sweeper in the day. Yeah, in the, that was say, the other day in the seventies. Yeah, way before <laughs> the yeah. other day. Yeah, twenty years before. But uh, yeah. Jerry was a tremendous player. He had to be. Uh, you know, he had anybody would tell you any, anybody, even friends of mine would tell you I was less than adequate sometimes sweeping. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was okay, but I was no, uh, I was no, uh, uh, no dynamo. Well, luckily you had great, a uh, great back end. So they, did, they, they were so precise with their weight. You didn't have to be perfect. Right? <laughs> I wish. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, as I said, Jerry's a very good player. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he swept. Uh, yeah, we, we always still yeah. kidded ourselves. Said, well, yeah, Jerry, I'll judge the way you do the sweep. It. <laughs> now you guys were kind of deemed a super team right away, right? Or who, yeah, I think that was. Who sort of called that out? Right I off the know. bat, was there was there animosity in BC at the time about it at all, or no? Or just there really was, wasn't much they could do. We were playing by the rules. Yeah. We all lived in the same place. We all place. lived in the same what place. What are you going to do? And Pat didn't want to skip, and I didn't mind moving down. And Jerry was like, if there's player. any ego at all, it doesn't work, right? Oh God, no. The biggest problem was it took uh, it took Pat and Rick a while to sort it out, but there was never any question that they were going to. But that first year took. That was the uh, the first the year was pains. frustrating. Yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. um, did you have to give Pat any advice? Like when you came in, did Pat say, "Hey, like what? How do I deal with Rick?" No, I, I think I think Pat actually between Pat and Rick, they sorted out themselves. I mean, they're two dynamic personalities, two great players, uh, two different styles, historic historic players, yeah, two different styles, really. Um, and although Rick, I think became adapted more and more to the more hitting uh, style uh, as we moved along, maybe because that's what he had in front of him. I mean, Pat could draw, no question. But I mean, you've got maybe the best hitter that ever played up until the new ice conditions and stuff over the last 10 years. Are you going to waste him? <laughs> no, you're going you're gonna to use him for the weapon he is. And I think it took Rick and Pat a while to sort that out. And there was never any doubt with that Rick would, if we had to draw that four foot to win a game, that was like, we weren't even worried about that part. Let's just get to that shot somehow. You know, that was, 
that, that, that was never going to be missed. So, you know, so you, you skip properly and you skip to win the game, not massacre somebody. So we, okay, so with that team of skips, if you will, because that's the way it was sort of coined, yeah. was, so there really was rarely times where you got the four of you would all stand around the house and try to, and, and get, no, it was always, it was kind of Rick the General. Uh, old, uh, Rick and Pat, most, yeah, they had to sort that out for, took a yeah. couple of years. And then once they got it sorted out and they figured out what they were doing, for me, uh, I was more than happy to, I got two of the greatest players yeah. in the world. If they can't figure out how the hell am I? Uh, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> I mean, I, I, sure, I had my own ideas, but I was more kind of a defensive-minded guy. So I was probably the wrong guy to be feeding feeding uh, information back to those two. They needed to be, uh, yeah. they needed to work it out. They worked it out very well. I mean, 93, when we did go, I think we could have won that. We could have won that final and we ended up winning the 94 final. So. Well, okay, take take me back through 93 because these are two of the more interesting briars. I've talked to a few folks about it. I hope to talk to more. Jerry Richard actually tells me, I, I didn't interview him yet on, on recording, but I talked to him at the Halifax Briar in 2010 and we talked about the uh, the famous 94 final. Um, so let's start on 93 first, which was a, a bizarre for a few reasons. You've got the... Um, I guess so. Shorty comes in, and that was a, that was that was in um, the ice was less than perfect to start to start with. In okay, Ottawa, yeah. and it's in the in the building with this sloped roof. So there's there's some dynamic problems in the building as far as heat control and everything like that was going. I think we had sheets over the rocks in the whole nine yards, and uh, so, so no one was enjoying it. Nobody like, was really enjoying the, it. The, the, the ice wasn't curling. It wasn't overly quick. It was kind of a struggle. Uh, and then uh, I guess Shorty got permission or took, I don't know. What well, I don't know about was. the permission. I've I never really been the, able to get clarity on that. that, yeah. he was, <laughs> that everybody's complaining because the ice wasn't curling, right? And it wasn't, you know, so I was, uh, you know, they had TV then as far as every draw. And uh, so I, I was sitting in the hotel room. I flipped the TV on. Oh, you, oh, you didn't we play that morning? on the morning draw. Which was a, a benefit, and, yeah. And, and the first thing I saw was Wayne Madaw missing a hit by like two feet. <laughs> and I, I kind of snapped to attention. Went, mm. Well, that doesn't look right. <laughs> and we started watching and the rocks were just going everywhere. Right. And it was a real well, crazy what, time. What I, what I found interesting about that is there's certainly speculation that if Shorty Jenkins is coming in and doing the ice, but no one else has told about it, you have to think Russ and Glenn might have known about it. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know. but but that it actually impacted them. Right. And uh, I, yeah. I mean, I think. I, I mean, sure, they had a relationship with Shorty, but I don't think that that would have had anything to but do with that. But why didn't anyone know? Why didn't they let people know? Hey, by the way, the ice might be different this morning. <laughs> well, you know. Because I've heard no one, they you didn't tell anybody. The guys practicing yeah. could have maybe figured At it out pretty time. quick. <laughs> like when the first one actually curled eight feet but, or whatever. But this was like two different events. Oh, it was oh, like totally. Briar oh, number I, one and Briar yeah. number two. <laughs> oh, yeah. But anyway, Briar number two only lasted for... A little while. A couple days, yeah, Until they got it back to, and at the end, it was very Well, then nice. it was Briar number three, yeah. which was, now it's a Briar between four teams, and we got to figure out how that's going to work. Four and, we tie, four <laughs> we tie for first place, yeah. So where were you on the ice? Were you on that last draw that Peters played in that last draw, or were you guys off at that point? Do you remember, you remember the situation with well, kind of the... Well, playing at the end? Because at the time, Vic's team, I think Vic had been told just before, but Vic's team thought if they win their first place. Yeah, I think they, yeah, but it was... That wasn't going to be the case, yeah. No, it wasn't the rule, and I know that yeah. they beat the three of us, but it didn't work out because was, there was no rule written for it. And uh, so there was a big kerfuffle, and, and there was a big, how, how are we going to decide who plays who and all this other stuff, which was, even that was a bit crazy. And this is just right after the game, right? Yeah, and, so it, it becomes... and this was pretty crazy too. And we, so there's a big kerfuffle in the whole thing, and then the, so the CCA decided that it was a four-way tie for first, and we're going to draw all four skips are going to throw a draw shot at the same time on a different sheet of ice. Oh, it was going to be the same time originally. Well, that it was, was the, the same okay. time, basically. And uh, because I know it was because we delayed a couple seconds. And we we're, the, me and Jerry were looking to see where everybody was. And uh, we managed to end up getting to play Rick Lang. <laughs> well, no, I think, well, I think the way it worked out, Rick, or no, sorry, Vic Peters didn't throw. I think that was the one. They they would be sort of the the number one seed of the four. Well, teams. maybe that was it. Well, all I know is that all I know is that we were able to see what was going on on the other mm -hmm. sheets, and we we ended up not playing Vic or Russ. Not because Rick had a bad team, but we <laughs> that that's it, the game that you knew you wanted. Yeah, it was a preferential draw at that point. So where did your draw end up? Well, wherever we put it. Well, okay. <laughs> okay. It, it and, and by the by the it, way, I, I still remember that Dan Carey talked about that because he said you guys essentially had control over who yeah. you were going to play. Yeah, yeah, we pretty much did. Yeah. Didn't make sense. Yeah. No, it was the way it goes. <laughs> so, so you I were, don't, all I remember is that Jerry and I got to have a good look, and I think Pat was kind of scouting out there a little bit. And, uh, yeah, and uh, Pat was calling it Rick through it, of course, and 
Pat's calling the sweep coming in, and I believe that we were looking for placement. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a bit screwy, yeah. and uh, and it ended up, you mm-hmm. know, we ended up playing Russ in the final. Vic lost to Russ, and mm-hmm. which was I, I don't I felt sorry for Vic. Well, there was a bunch of games, right? Because you had they so the, he loses to Russ, but then he still gets another chance because nope. it was like no, no, there was it was kind of like the first page. It was a weird setup. Mm, I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. I'd have to look yeah. back on that. Here, I can take you through it. Here, let's let's <laughs> do. It. That's what Wikipedia is for, right? Because then the next year was when they brought in the page system, right? Right in ninety four. Uh, it was a playoff system. Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, kind of a pagey system, I guess. Yeah. Well, they were still kind of. Or think, they just yeah went to. Well, what happened there? No, because there was only three t- teams for playoffs then, wasn't there? I'll take you through the memory of it. So the, um, okay, so here we go. Here's this playoffs. Oh, the tiebreakers. Oh, my goodness. So, yeah, so you got Howard plays Peters, and then uh, you guys played Lang. Right. And then, so then Lang played Peters, and then you guys played Howard, right? So it was sort of Lang and Peters. So it was like a page, right? So you got— it no, was We ended a, up playing Russ in the final. Yeah, but you also played him in the tiebreaker, right? Which you actually lost 3-1. to one. Okay. Yeah, and a 3-1 game against the Howards, which is not necessarily common, old but rules. maybe that's, yeah, old rules. They were happy to do it. <laughs> yeah, and Peters, uh, you know, lost. And, and uh, I do remember this. Yeah, all this. And, and Peters lost to Lang in very devastating fashion because it was they were actually up five four and they gave up gave up one steal one steal one eight nine ten. Likely at that point, Dan was just remember ready to just break a oh, dozen boons. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, and 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 a rough situation. So and then now you're in the playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> so you play two games. Now you're now there's a three, three team playoff. Right? Go forever. No, you, now you're playing Rick Lang again. Yeah, in the in the semi, kind of a crazy experience. Like yeah. it was probably it's a, a lot of extra curling. Because you got all that information. Well, it's a lot of extra curling. There was a lot of curling. <laughs> I remember there was a lot of curling. So I'd have to think that your veteran experience probably helped get you guys just through that because it was probably just crazy. I think the all those thing. teams had a lot of experience. Well, they were, and, you're right. Rick's and, a uh, senior guy. And, 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 every, and everybody out there was... Everybody out there had an idea what was going on and what was going on. It probably f- affected Vic's team more than anybody. I think if they had known more about what could happen, like, say, Wednesday or Thursday, which Warren tells me that he let people know on Wednesday. Not people. He let the Manitoba representatives, uh, like C. Swat and some of these folks, but they didn't necessarily tell Vic and the team. They were maybe having a little too much fun in the Purple Hearts Lounge, I heard. so Something, something <laughs> tells me that, that we knew that, that it might not happen. That, yeah. that it wouldn't, he wouldn't be a clear winner. But he certainly thought he was. Yeah, and, yeah. Then, and not finding out, I think, until that moment. And then having to go right but back. But I do. It's all starting to that other person starting to come back to me now. Because basically all I can remember is playing Lang and then playing Howard. I mean, yeah. there was a lot going on. Allegedly, you played Lang and Howard and then Lang and Howard again. <laughs> seems like a lot of Lang. Seems like a lot of that, it yeah. Seems like a lot of Lang there and there. But anyway, allegedly, if you got it there, I'll... I'll now, how was... Okay, so, so we'll talk about 94 where it gets even more interesting. But was there... Uh, some buildup of any animosity with Howard. Was there some other, because there was some, was there any other history with, with Russ with the, uh, well, I think Glenn with the headphones the, and all I, that I think stuff that everything? Russ with the headphones, they're trying yeah. to get away with the walkie talkies in Saskatoon that left a bitter taste in everybody's mouth. Because, that was 89. You know, right? He was yeah. getting away with that. And then we ended up playing him in the semi, then losing to Pat. Yeah. And yeah, he had car stairs and those guys. And so the, so there, there'd been already some bad. A little history, yeah. but I mean, you bit. know, I mean, he was trying to work the rules. I mean, whatever. I mean, uh, he definitely had no voice. So yeah. he, had for, yeah. he had to try to do something, <laughs> hand signals or go with Whatever. the Bellier whistle or something. He had to try and do something right. By the time we get to 93 then, in that final game, they were, that was a good team. I mean, that was, I think a lot of people consider oh, that pretty, one. Yeah. I mean, with, well, with, with uh, Wayne playing second and Peter at lead and. Well, they had, they had, a, they had a great team. There's no, nobody would argue that point. Is there a moment really in that game coach. though where something turned or that you think that. Uh, the only thing that I, I recall, I think I rolled out on a, somewhere in the middle of the game and it gave them a chance to set up a deuce and it ended up being the deuce that cost us a game, I think, but I rolled out a, trying to probably, I, I, it was probably one of those situations where I had to stick and they had, probably had third shot somewhere and I rolled out and they were able to build their deuce. So I, I, I held that moment for a while. I can remember yeah. rolling out on that shot. Very, very, very uh, <clears throat> plain to me. Most other guys probably forgot about it, but I remembered. And I think we lost by two in that game. I can't yeah, remember. Five three. Yeah, five and three. Yeah. Okay. Here you go. It's the next year. And sure enough, it's the same two teams that are into the playoff. Yeah. And uh, so I want to get your version of the story, which I've heard several <laughs> times, because I love hearing different versions of stories. That's I find this the funniest, right? I was rereading some of the Bob Weeks book because it is written about in there a little bit. But I had always heard the story about the rock handles through through people I knew and people in the Red Deer area. And it became its own sort of little legendary story. And yeah. Pat told it his version of it. And what I want to kind of get from you was, because I've heard a couple different ways, and Rick talked to me about it again, again, to set the stage, if these people haven't listened to those previous episodes, 
they rewrote the rule book. So the three rock rule comes in. You're playing a three rock free yep. guard zone. Because they rewrote the rule book, they rewrote rules. And one of them was they wrote something related to who chooses the rocks. Rock selection. Right? So rock selection. And it was first ranked team after the round robin play chooses rocks. And then and then the next team and the next well, team. Well, that's not necessarily how it read. Well, which, but it makes no sense, obviously, because who would... Yeah. Why would you do that? Right. Yeah. So, what do you remember or recall from that? Well, our, our our interpretation of the rule basically is that the first place team gets to choose rocks. So we waited till after the semi and chose rock, and that nobody complained about it till we took her Howard's rock. <laughs> then there became a bit of a kerfuffle. The way I understand it, and then rereading it was, and I've heard different versions, is at some point the CCA is pushing you guys to choose your rocks before the semifinal is played, essentially. Uh, I don't remember being pushed or, or being, at, you know, choose your rocks. Well, I think we were pretty out of it. They were, they, and you're saying, we, no, we're, we're not going, we're, we're not going to until the yeah. game's over. So, I mean, it was because I, it wasn't stated that you picked them as rain. I mean, why would we, obviously Howard's going to pick opposite to us and because he's expected to play us. Why would, why would we forfeit our hard fought first place by mm -hmm. giving him that advantage? Well, in the way I heard it and the way, Pat explains it to me that I, that kind of makes sense, which was, okay, f finally, if you're going to ask me the color, we're going to choose the color of the winning team in the semifinal. Yeah. And now I've read differently because it, they didn't explain that, 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 part, but, that, that, that which makes that's, perfect that's sense. One, that, makes, that, makes, <laughs> that makes sense, right? And so Pat goes over that, but I don't still don't think it was written that clearly. So at the end of the day, they win and we say, well, we're taking those rocks and we only took four of the rocks. It wasn't like, and <laughs> I think. But that uh, was, you got those rock handles. You essentially had a choice got those of the rocks yellow. And then Pat and Rick sent me to the meeting because they, they I, I was under orders not to budge. So, so there was a meeting. So at the. Well, there was a meeting about This it, was yeah. after. After the game, after the semi. After the semi, okay. And I don't think Pat and Rick really wanted to be any part well, of it. Well, why? So because so, Russ had issue with well, the Russ decision? Well, Russ didn't like the way we were doing it. Okay. Because <laughs> then we picked our rocks. So does he <laughs> find out about it at that point? I think so. Or maybe, yeah. Because yeah. I, I can never figure, I got to talk to Russ. I that, think but, so. Yeah. I, I mean, I, it, it's a bit sketchy, but I remember <laughs> at the end of the day, we were allowed to pick the eight rocks we wanted and plus two spares. And so you're the one rep team representative I was the at, guy there. at this meeting. So okay. I, I, I had the rocks yeah. written down all that shit. And, but then they decided to make it more fair. They could pick from the rest of the rocks. Now, when did you find so, out? And when so did you we, find out about that exactly? Though? So we at the meeting and I go like, yeah, okay, whatever. I don't oh, that was explained in the meeting. Yeah. So that, that at the meeting, because right after that, out, everybody went, but well, not everybody. Wayne got out first and he already had a list of rocks and he, he was the guy with the wrench and the handles and Jim Armstrong ended up being, ended up being his, arm, his, his escort so that they didn't screw with our rocks that we had selected. So Wayne, you know, they went through and they figured it out and I guess Wayne got whatever. At the end of the day, I don't think the rocks really, it, it created a, quite a stir, um, but... Well, because when you went back, so you knew that, so that was explained in the meeting that they were going to choose these other rocks. When yeah. you went back and explained this to Pat and Rick, how was their They were reaction? happy as long as we had the ones we wanted. Yeah. There was no... They didn't say, well, you screwed that up, Gretzinger. No, they didn't give me that one. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I thought we came out of it fine. And, and it was bothering them a lot more than it was bothering us, obviously. And mm -hmm. that was too, it, but, you know, there was no, there was a bit of animosity. Uh, but there were, that on MSC maybe had built a little bit somewhere else. I don't know. You know, we, we didn't, that was the only, the only place we ever played that was in Briars. There was other games. And, you know, I mean, if you got two really good teams, maybe at that point, maybe the two best teams uh, playing each other here and there. And uh, yeah, you're bound to get a little personality. I mean, I don't think Rick and Russ exchange Christmas cards right away after that, but maybe they are now. Um, I'm hopefully, hopefully, you know, time heals all kind of wounds. I mean, we're, we were all battlers. We were all warriors. We were all, we all wanted to win. I mean, and if the rules let you do something, well, I mean, why wouldn't you do it? Well, and I think that's the thing that, for a long time there, the CCA struggled with was always trying to get just on top of things, right? Yeah. But at least they finally wrote, but they finally made decisions and wrote proper Started rules. Started to do that, yeah. 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 <laughs> and, uh, you know, the part where we were moving rocks from everywhere, that I think went by the boards. I think mm -hmm. now they have to take sets. And I think there's things like they, they finally got a few things sorted because we had rocks from every sheet in the building, right? I mean, it was crazy. Uh, and that, yeah, but I mean, it was, uh, the final itself was a pretty intense game though. Well, it, it, was a, like, it, yeah. was, it was pretty intense, yeah. Yeah, it was probably as intense a game as as you would want to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was, you know, we we got the jump. We got, you know, we had last rock to start. We got a jump on him. Russ had a 
he missed a shot in the fifth end, which put us up in pretty good control. And, uh, you know, basically it was, you know, but it was a lot of good shots and we had to keep playing hard because they're not quitting. Those guys, that's, that's, that's a tough team. You know, they're going to keep, they're going to keep coming. And uh, it was, yeah, it, it was, it was fun playing three rock because everybody thought everybody, everybody wrote us off because, you know, that we but they forgot. I mean, Rick and Pat are a couple of the best players in the world. So I wasn't really too worried about the rule change and I, I can draw too. So, I mean, I wasn't too, you know, I mean, it wasn't, too uh, upset but we uh it was a great it was a great game and it was a lot of a lot of interest in it and it was uh, some good funny things happened after <laughs> yeah oh, what <laughs> during was it i mean well you see the little things you know that you know people coming up to you and say, you know telling you about the rocks and you know all this stuff yeah there everybody had their own version of what happened and yeah the, the funniest thing i saw there was a cartoon in the paper Okay. The next day, where the yellow rocks, I can't even remember what color we took, where the uh, yellow rocks, I think, crumbled the red ones. It was in the Calgary Herald or something. It, it, and I think I still got a copy of it in a scrapbook. And the yellow rocks just crumbled the red rocks on contact. The red rocks just withered. It just turned into dust. <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of humorous. Finally, after many, many years, starting out, and as you said, like as a uh, very young in Calgary when you were a kid, yeah. you you make a world championship. Yeah, finally getting to, uh, there's some uh, there's some ju- some satisfaction and justification in that. You spent a lot of all years, all these hours and all this time, <laughs> yeah. and yeah, spent all these years doing different things. And you finally get to the top. I mean, it's you know every year there's like one team finishes first. And that's certainly the way we looked at it. Did you have to be careful? Because it can be a letdown then getting to the Worlds at that point, wasn't well, it? We not a letdown, no, but a... But Pat and Rick were pretty much... I mean, Pat had been through a couple and Rick had been through one. And uh, and we were they're pretty... Yeah, you know, we were experienced enough to know that everybody can beat you and you, we see what the ice is going to be. And it's kind of funny. When we got to Overstore, we're going, oh, this ice is pretty fast. Yeah, it's really fast going one way and not that fast going the other way. It was yeah. like uphill, downhill a bit. So it takes a little bit of get, getting used to stuff like that. But it was, yeah, it was it was great to win. And certainly the highlight of, the, of, of any career is to be at the top of your sport, even if it's for a brief time. So what what so what so happened with the team? Because you guys, and I think you came back the next year, right? Yeah, we played the next year. We lost the we lost this, the semifinal of the provincial in '96. Well, the next year we went to the Briar again in '95. Yeah, you went to the Briar again. Yeah, yeah in Halifax, but the ice was that was oh yeah, that, that was, was the a strange one. Yeah, yeah, and we kept being stubborn about drawing, and it was not drawing ice, so uh, we paid the price, and we were all in favor of drawing, but it turned out it was a bad idea. But it was a good. It ended up they got the ice straightened out after we had pretty much taken our saves out of contention. Mm. But uh, and Eddie was there. I think that might have been Eddie's last prior. And again, a fast ice player stuck on slow, non-turn, you know, bad ice basically. But once they got things turned around after about the Wednesday morning, they started to get it turned around. And I, actually, I think the curling was reasonable after that. And I think Kerry ended up winning, as I recall. Yeah, Kerry. While well, I was and as a as a kid growing up at the Ascent yeah. in, in Manitoba. Uh, you're cheering for Kerry, but you're going to remember that moment where, so Kevin Martin is, essentially has him in trouble. He looks, and that's Martin with that but that's the semi, team. And it? He, that's in the semifinal. It looks yeah. like he's going to beat Kerry, yeah. right? And Kerry makes the, I don't know, whatever it was, like 30-foot raise. Oh, some incredible Some shot. crazy raise. And, and then I think Kevin Martin kind of really beat himself up over thinking, like, why did I leave him that shot? Questioning the call the whole time. Really and hard then, to beat yourself but, up. Over but really, it was, no, but really, I mean, the game, the game is only the third end, I think, yeah. or something. And the, uh, the game wasn't over, but it just sort of felt like it was over at that moment. I was and, in Briar Patch when that happened, I'm pretty sure. And then that was and then they played uh Brad Height in the yeah. in the final. But I, I think Kerry uh I think Kerry was full value for winning that Briar. I don't I, I there was gonna be there was about five teams could win that Briar if their ice was good. It was a hell of a field. It for was sure. a good field. Yeah. And then uh but then so what happened with your squad though, like just in terms of the Well the team, uh, just... after ninety five then we played in ninety six and ninety six was our last year. We Seemed to lack a bit of motivation, I would say. We didn't pay attention to a few details that we could have. We ended up losing the semifinal in the provincial, and you know, we had a meeting. And Pat, I think Pat was satisfied with what the team had done. And I, I, I think Rick and I were, were, you know, I was, I, I didn't want to give up the team, but on the other hand, the writing's on the wall. Sometimes it's just enough, right? And you'd played with Rick for quite a while at that yeah, point. Yeah, right? I played. So, I played with Rick for another. year. I think about six years. Like for most teams, right? Six years is a. Is a long it's a spell, long time. It's right? a long stretch. Just, just that yeah. kind of number. Yeah. So I played with Rick for, so Pat moved on and I played with Rick. Jerry, I think, played with one year. We got a new second. I moved up. Uh, we got to provincials, but we were, we, we were, weren't that. And then the next year, Rick wanted to, uh, 
It was suggested that we had played together long enough, and <laughs> I think we both agreed to that fact. So, yeah. uh, and then I went back to skipping, and Rick kept skipping. Did you hook up with Bob Russell at that moment when you went back to skipping, um, or was it a little bit after? No, I played with uh, with uh, with Kofsky and mm-hmm. the, the same front end I ended up with for a while with uh, Dave Miloff and, and Mark Whittle, and uh, played a year with Rob. We won a couple cash spiels. I think we got to the provincials and. Then Rob decided he wanted to go another direction, and Bob was coming to town. So we said, hey, well, we'll just see if, see if Bob wants to play. So we got a hold of Bob, and I think he made us promise we were going to go to the Briar. Of course, we did promise, but and we did go. But it was only, they, those, the two were totally uncorrelated. <laughs> it was, you make any kind of promise to get a good player like Bob on your team, and then you hope the hell you can uh, perform. And did and, you have, did did. have any good battles along the way getting out of BC then to get out? In, uh, with, with who? In, well, in 99 then, so when you got yeah, out yeah, with, with Bob, yeah. We ended up playing uh, Macaulay in the final. And we we won that final, and then uh, we went to the Briar and finished just out of the playoffs. And mm-hmm. then uh, the next year, he beat us in the final, and uh, he went on one world championship. So there you go. So two good teams again. Uh, we didn't adapt. I, I The 99 Briar, I, I think I got to take a little bit, bit of responsibility for us not playing better because, yeah, we kind of, it was exciting and we got, you know, first Briar for three of them. And uh, I could have been a little more uh, restrained in my enthusiasm for having all the kids and everything ch- coming and we kind of upset the rhythm of the team a bit. I, I think I should have stayed rooming with, we should have kept our, our, our arrangements the same way as they had been. I learned that lesson before, but I thought we were, Maybe going to be able to get away with it, but no, no. I, it was it was a rough fun. We we never really played as good as we could play. I mm-hmm. don't think, and I think that I, I I could have made some better decisions about how to organize the sleeping arrangements and things like that. But we well, but you must have done a better job then in a one at the trials because you guys had a, a phenomenal experience. We like, were run there. yeah, we were. You know, we were pretty zeroed in. We were. Uh, now, we were, how did you qualify for that one? I was. Was that one of those ones where you had to win? We won the, a qualifying event here. The events, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Forty-eight teams, one winner. Um, yeah, it was pretty. That was pretty crazy too. I mean, we've been playing pretty good, but we lost our first. Well, we were, we were in C very quick. Like we were like Gretzinger is a tough enough name, but with a magnifying glass, you know, way way out there. And then we got on a roll and started beating some teams and got playing well and. Got to, it was kind of an interesting way to qualify for the trials because uh, we were playing our semi. And I, to be honest with you, I don't even remember who we were playing. And Mada was playing somebody. And if he wins, we're in if we win. So because he already had his spot. It was a bit fl- flawed process. But the way it worked out, we he won and we won. So we're in. And then uh, we went out and had a couple of beers and some pizza and came back for the final. And for some reason, there was a kerfuffle about rock selection. <laughs> Again? <laughs> <laughs> it was it was kind of weird because it was just a regular it was run, being run like a regular cash spiel so there was no moving rocks around I don't think you're so, on the sheet you're on the sheet yeah Isn't we're on the sheet, we're on the sheet yeah. the way we went and uh, Wayne was bitter about that a bit and it was I mean it was what it was right and uh, McCarroll was you know so we we got out there and all we wanted to was play the game as fast as possible get back to dressing you knew because you're we in. were in right you knew you're in, we, yeah. we didn't even care about you know if we won the spiel that's fine but. By the time they sorted it all out and everybody got out of the ice, Bob had woken up, Mark had woken up, and I, w- I was starting to get a little bit agitated. And, and it ended up being a he- heck of a curling game, and uh, I, we managed to beat him in the end. So I don't feel like we backed in after that. So if they'd have just quieted down about the rocks and got you when you know, you were oh, already a few beers in, I they might have had they, a better chance. They'd have killed us. <laughs> we, were, we were there to be taken. We, already had, we, already, we had already attained what the goal that we had set. So it wasn't like we were uh, the extra a few thousand dollars for first place wasn't really a motivator at that point. But uh, yeah, so they were cutting into some serious drinking time about then. We wanted to get, you know, the, the Olympic Committee probably didn't want to hear that part, but whatever. And then, so what we did the next year, we we focused on that. Um, yeah, because you know in advance you got this. Yeah, that we didn't have up. a very good second half of that season. And, you know, we I, I think we, I, I think, I don't even know if we got to provincial. So I guess we did. We lost out fast. But uh, over the summer, we developed a thing. We, got, we actually got engaged a nutritionist and a sports psychologist and, um, a, a coach, uh, you know, and uh, so we we started to get our act together. We were kind of a little bit ahead of the curve, but most of the other teams hadn't yeah. got to that point yet. They hadn't really figured it out, and we got well, there. not men's teams in particular. Yeah. I mean, some I know yeah. Colleen Jones in particular. They had, but, but we the work we got them, it going. Yeah. By the time you know we started off slow the next fall, but we by the time we kind of peaked at the right time, we won a spiel just before and uh, got there, and we had this pregame thing all done. We had everything scripted. 
And we were getting there way before the other teams, and we were doing walk-arounds and mental preparation, getting loose, getting familiar. So was this a big step change for you, particularly at that stage? Like, you're well into your Doing that type career, of right? Yeah. 50 years old. Yeah. So, like, this is a totally, <laughs> is this totally foreign to you? Totally like, foreign, yeah. yeah. But, oh, yeah. We, you know, we decided that we needed to to try and maximize it. And, yeah, and, uh, you know, we rode, we, we mm-hmm. played well. And I, I don't think, I, you know, we're, there's no apologies there. I mean, we could easily have gone to the Olympics. It was, uh, you know, we had beat Kevin and we had lost to Kerry and we ended up playing Kerry in the semi. And uh, Kerry beat us again. So there you go. And then Kerry lost to Kevin. But that was probably... Uh, yeah, and you, you were up... Well, no, you cracked a three and sort of gave up a deuce right back against Kerry. So it was kind of a whirlwind f- first few ends, I guess, right? And then just uh, yeah, yeah, I remember the, the game against Kerry was we ended up one down coming home and, and he had last rock. But we we bedposted him and he had, to make, he had to draw the forefoot to win, I think. And he did. Good skips do that to you. Yeah. But the odd one, the odd time they'll miss. But well, uh, and it's interesting, right? So you think about those first two uh, trials. You had Ed Wernick loses in the semifinal in 97. And then there you are at your age losing the, the semifinal yeah, in, in a one. You, and it's funny. It's like the CCA is probably thinking, thank God we don't have these old guys going. In the, we yeah, need athletes, I, right? I had a young team. That's true. They were That's fairly true. out there. I mean, not real young. Maybe they're younger. Uh, but yeah, but they were. Yeah. Up, no, but there was definitely a. An idea we want to we want the perception oh, of the of the athlete oh, to, oh, to go want, and they didn't want me at the, at the, <laughs> in the twilight of my career, but I, I mean, we put a lot of hours into that. We put a lot of work into it, a lot of effort. Yeah. And, hey, you I mean, know, Ru- we were, in 06, we were really close. Russ did it in 06, and he wasn't a young chicken either. And well, you know, Russ, and, Russ kind of he, he, that was an interesting situation yeah. for him, and, and more more power to him to to, to guide that through. But uh, yeah, but oh one was if we'd have got there, it would have been amazing. But I, it would have been obviously. The experience of a lifetime, but for you then was uh, Pasto one. Did you still uh, play as much? Did you take runs at the seniors? Were you? What well, was your... after after a one, that's when we they started. We started talking up the tour thing, and so we didn't play any more provincials. We well, played, did you do? Were you part of the the yeah, boycott team then? We were part of the part of the team because I had seen the Briars. The Briars used to be a fantastic thing, and then all this stuff, and it was. But they had been getting chintzier and chintzier, and you know teams were just. But the teams were getting paid. There was no. There was no. The 99 bar was a little bit disappointing, I think, for yet, me. Yeah, they're me pulling these I, big audiences. I've seen the other ones, yeah. So right? it, it's yeah. really hard to say. There's pros and cons to that, but I think the players needed to have more control. Um, I was, yeah, I mean, we played for a couple of years uh, as boy, I mean, uh, during that. And why boycott? But for you, yeah, well, no, I, get, I mean, it's, I guess it's... It's a, no, but that's a tough thing to ask of you as an example. You're, you, you know, at that stage in your curling life, you're thinking, I, I may not have a lot of Purple Hearts left in me to say, um, sure, hey, yeah. hey, Bert, why don't you not play for a couple of years, two, three years, yeah. and don't try for it? I mean, that's a lot to ask, really, don't you uh, think? I mean, you know, I, it, I realized it was probably the, at the end, although I kept trying, but... Um, yeah, so we took the two years out, and then Bobby moved on, and he ended up playing with Pat, and they went to a briar, and it was Pat's younger than me, so <laughs> we, we all let him do that, and... Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I, I, you know, it was, it, I probably had like 200 decent runs in provincials, but as you get a little bit older, I think the last time was 08, we had a decent run, but I, it was hard work, you know, and, and we were not a young team. I think we, it was Rob and me and Brent Giles, and so we were all well into our 50s, and yeah. we, we had Rob's son playing with us, and we ran off a few wins in a row, and then slowly but surely we ran out of gas, and you know, and it was, it's obvious you're 57 years old. You shouldn't be going to, <laughs> it's, you, it's pretty soon it's time for, this is over. Too many, and plus everything ached. Well, did parts. you play some seniors though? Did you, yeah, uh, we, we yeah. played seniors and we we went to uh, national seniors. And I can't remember what year it was. We went to PEI. That was fun. That happens a lot, by the way, in seniors. It's, I can't, I went there. I can't remember which year it was. That's, yeah, I ask well, guys about that all the time. It's, well, I remember because it was yeah. a hell of a field actually. It was. Uh, it usually is. It yeah. was us yeah. and Hackner and um, the redhead fellow out of Manitoba, fiery competitor um uh, oh doug harrison harrison yeah and yeah he, he was there and there was uh, uh was funny how a, i knew a couple other guys yeah fiery <laughs> competitor he fire is. redhead yeah yeah, yeah. and uh Milosek, he was kind of red here too anyway um yeah so we, we had a great great time we made mm-hmm. playoffs and lost to al i think or or doug i can't remember but it well, was, it's gonna it be hard fun. to compete with. Al still plays as much as he can. Like I, I can't believe how much that guy still curls. Like, exactly. he, yeah. Well, he still loves to play, and 
Obviously, his knees don't hurt like mine do. I know. Yeah. That's the thing I can't figure out, right? Like, yeah. At some I have, point. Yeah. yeah I, I just got tired of the ibuprofen and the Aleve and uh, all that stuff. And, 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 and then you'd make the mistake of looking back at a picture of the way you used to throw a rock. And then you'd yeah. see the reality of how you throw it now. You go, oh, God. Well, yeah, that's the, that's the problem with curling. It hasn't really evolved like golf. Like in golf, you know, back in the old days, you'd use a persimmon wood and you use these bolata balls. Yeah. And now all the technology you hit it better than you used to. In curling, they don't have that available. No. <laughs> other, no. Than the, well, the, the other than that little the stick or maybe you slide with the, uh, uh, I don't want to call it a crutch because that's not, we don't like to call it that. But, you know, something ladies, like the that. The ladies' aid, you mean? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sorry. Okay. <laughs> My I'll, apologies, stole. I'll, I'll, I'll cut that part out too. But. <laughs> the um those devices but uh so you still uh, toss them once in a while now or no you just i haven't, nah. throw, I, I haven't thrown a rock since 2012 or 11 maybe i just i come down and you know i it's 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 okay but i actually last year i went came out and slid around a little bit just to see because my the company that uh, that i have they everybody who works for me would decide they want to have a christmas party at the curling rink and i should be really good at it and i went oh yeah i, I, yeah, I can see yeah. this now <laughs> so i came down and jock had a good chuckle while i tried to get up mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, like you can get in your crouch you just can't get out of it well, That's I, yeah. down is easy yeah <laughs> up is impossible uh so yeah i yeah, know i i think that you know we'll let that we'll let that go away sort of thing but it was it was mm-hmm. it was yeah it was i got no complaints i had a, a great career great fun man lots of good people and that's what you miss the most i think when you finally look at yourself and go like you think you're good but you're not really anymore so maybe you know maybe it's time but the and, young guys but it's yeah it's just the way it is and it, the people are the thing right it's a great the sport is full of great people and you know you might have your run-ins with the odd guy here and there but at the end of the day you, normally you all say hello and goodbye i mean it's not well, yeah, I missed one of those, actually. When we were talking about the, the Howard um, rivalry that you guys had in one of the books, I think it was, again, in Bob Week's book, he talks a bit about 94. I think it was during the round robin game then. There was some uh, some things maybe with maybe guys moving around or there was a bit of gamesmanship. Do you, were, do you specifically uh, remember that? Or did I, you I, just I, I of... think that they, well, either Wayne, or probably maybe Wayne got on us for leaving a knee print or a hand print or something. I mean, there was always that. That was going back and forth all the time? Well, yeah. yeah, but they were always more worried about it than us. Just going to sweep over the bloody thing. If they, you know, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was, yeah, that that's probably all it was. I mean, I don't remember. I would never move. I, I, I watch TV now and... I think some of the times, well, that etiquette wouldn't have got by in the old days. Somebody would have drilled you by now. <laughs> you wouldn't yeah. want Tommy Wilson, standing, who used to play second for Rick Folk. You wouldn't want him standing there in your way when you were running down the ice while his skip was trying to throw. Yeah, it might be cha- might be dangerous, but yeah. yeah. But uh, any other gamesmanship stories then that you remember, or little things like that? I think that. Uh, I mean, there's the, 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 the games that you laugh about was, now, or yeah. I, I, I always laugh. But, you know, one I, I learned a lot from Bernie Sparks, but I did learn one thing from him: is, is that is you can always get an edge if you're if you're looking, I guess. And the, when I was playing with for Glenn Pierce way back there, whenever that was seventy four or whatever, yeah, we're just getting ready to go out and play the provincial final against Bernie, and uh, I hadn't really played with him, and I got to I knew him a bit. He came up to me before the game, and he said, "Yeah, you're really playing well." He said, "Yeah," he says. Really love what you're doing with that outturn now. And he and said he that to you. Away, he, he said that to me and he walked away. <laughs> well, I was I was just this young kid. And yeah. I was like, eh? <laughs> and it just it just it put me down. He just planted something in your uh, mind well, at that point. And yeah. for the first end or so, I'm going, what the? You know, I'm trying to concentrate on the game, and he's got he's got this little seed in my head. And I, <laughs> and I, I, I would say I. He got me, I, but yeah. you know it was that's okay. Did you joke with him about it after when oh, you yeah. play with him? I guess yeah, yeah that's a good one. Yeah, yeah no, I said you should see my intern. <laughs> and you never will, but <laughs> oh, so man. yeah, but that was a, you know little things like that. <laughs> that's a good one. That's a great story. Anything else that we missed, or any other good stories that kind of jog uh, your memory a bit? Uh, you know, just I of mean, anything. There's always stories that can't be told, so we have to stay yeah. away from those. Well, it's it's a family show, but you know you can, yeah. you can push it as far. Uh, Some people push it further than others. I mean, you'd be surprised who does, but, uh, yeah, well, you know, we, we try to keep it, on you know, well, okay. So no one ever got arrested as far as uh, you on, know, on your team. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's no arrests, anything like that. You never lost a player that never, that never, cause that's happened to a few guys from time yeah, to time, no, either we, before. We, or after. Actually, we did kind of lose one for, for a few, for a part of a game. Yeah. We had, <laughs> we had won a couple of boss spiels and then we went to the third boss spiel or we won a car spiel and then we came second in camel. So I think mm-hmm. we lost to Paul to Gosel or something. And then we went to Prince George, and this guy's there was Calcutta's then. They were legal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, 
Here's the and, and it was yeah. it was big. I mean, there was a, Chris Rose used to be. A well, you made more money in Calcutta than in the bond spiel. You right? could Something if you were silly enough to bet and. Um, but this uh, we had, we were on a roll. We were playing good. Prince George was next on the list, and we away we went. And uh, it was a long drive up. And some got pulled over by the cops for speeding, and they took all our alcohol all the way. And we did a couple little things like that. And eventually, we got to Prince George. Okay, so there was no arrest, but there was police. Yeah, there was, there, there was. Okay. Yeah, but it was. They, that's, they were that's very not kind. unusual. They were very but... kind to us and told us, you know, do not stop at the next liquor store and just <laughs> keep going. Keep and go, going. Okay. Yeah. Um, and uh, then we get to Prince George, and then uh, one of the guys on my team who I will, well, I I, I, I don't want to name anybody. Check but, the innocent, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but his, his initials were RK. Uh, and uh, he had some buddies there, and uh, he disappeared. And in the meantime, the Calcutta's on, and uh, we'd all, we were, none of us were feeling that great in the morning. But then we went for like about $5,000 or something, this guy, this fella from up there. And it was a big Calcutta, like 45 grand or something. And uh, we go for the first game, and we, we haven't seen Rob, we haven't heard from Rob. We don't know where Rob. Sorry, is. you weren't going to name him. Oh, ah, it's okay. <laughs> he'll be. He'll find this quite funny. And uh, so it's a. It's, there's just three of us, and we're doing okay. We're holding our own, and it's a tie game. And then, uh, but just after the fourth end, Rob shows up, and he probably didn't know the time. Maybe he missed up. Uh, yeah, the, the schedule. Anyway, so, whatever, he, yeah. so he gets all suited up, and out he comes. Yeah. And meanwhile, the guy who bought us at Calcutta is behind the sheet watching oh, his investment. No. <laughs> and uh, we uh, we get her rolling pretty good. And um, Rob gets out there and throws his first one, misses it completely. <laughs> uh, he throws his second one, misses it completely. So I, we're zero for two. And uh, Rob comes down to the uh, down to the other end, and they, he kind of gets me and says, "Just do you think the other guy'd mind if I if I didn't play the rest of the game?" <laughs> and the other guy, the other skip goes, "Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> you're in here, but you're in here now, buddy." <laughs> So, <laughs> so Rob earned a little nickname that time. We called him Silent Rob for a while after that. And he doesn't make much noise at the other end, and the game kind of went that way. Uh, in the meantime, the poor guy who bought us to Calcutta had to watch this act as he uh, he couldn't hit anything. He was yeah, it was it was kind of a, kind of an odd an odd show. But uh, all right, good. Well, I'm glad I'm glad I jarred that one. Then that's a great story. Yeah. There was a. Uh, was another guy who bought us in a Calcutta and didn't have the money to pay for it. Yeah, and that <laughs> happened to also in Prince George, a funny place, I guess. Smitty. Elgin mm-hmm. Smith was his name, a great guy. Uh, and uh, he was a curler. One of, that was back in the days of the big over 100 team interior bond spiels. And they play down and get down to 16 and they have a Calcutta. And he buys us. And we end up winning. And he gets this money. He came up and kissed me basically after he said, Thank God. He says, if you hadn't won, I'd be picking up bottles all the way back to Kimberly. <laughs> Oh. And Chris George and Kimberly's long way. Yeah. Because <laughs> he had no dough. But uh, oh, yeah. great guy. Yeah, so, so yeah, and you guys never decided by yourselves or anything like that or ever tried we, to do that? You know, or, we, you didn't, know? we never bought ourselves. And uh, uh, Bernie, the one year when we mm-hmm. were winning lots that year, he, in the Evergreen is a bond spiel in, in Vancouver, cash spiel. And uh, he bought us. Oh, no, he didn't buy us. He bought the guy we're not playing the final. Oh, really? So, <laughs> and if if we lose, Bernie makes more money than if we win. <laughs> That's an interesting so, bit situation. Of a, bit of a conundrum, but Bernie pulled through and we won. So, but but it could have, you know, it's a, it's a tough call. One of the reasons, yeah, like not buying your own team becomes somewhat in question in these uh, in these events, right? Back in the day. Well, yeah, but I mean, you know, Bernie was, you know, it was yeah. it was a good buy. He was a local guy and lots of good teams, and he, yeah. yeah. So Bernie just you know, so he was winning either way, though. Was the oh yeah, I mean, yeah, he was he was good either way, and Bernie was a hell of a comp- hell of a competitor, and, and and winning the trophy meant just as much to him as winning the money. So that was that was all good. Like I said, if you get, uh, I don't know. Anything else we miss? Let's think about. So, uh, I'm gonna try and keep. You see, there's a couple other stories we just can't. There's always tell. a part two, Bert. We can always do that. We can get. Uh, uh, see, the problem is the bar is not open. Uh, I find the stories get a little more entertaining. There was missed airplanes and yeah. things like that. Oh. <laughs> uh, you know, stuff where you, yeah. you. But now, but then when you played with Pat, did he bring kind of some of the rules that he had instilled uh, with it, or was Rick already kind of running the show a little bit? Yeah. And that team was. You know, I, I but think you guys were at that point. So. Already I, I, I think we were all season veterans by then. Yeah. by then to understand. He'd seen everything. Pat yeah. had some uh, good takes on it. So did yeah. Rick. I think the actual the actual key to when the team really gelled is when Rick and I decided that he and I both needed separate rooms uh, <laughs> because apparently uh, we were in Victoria playing as, in a boss player playing out. I can't remember. And uh, Rick and I were rooming, and I woke up in the morning. There was nobody in the bed next to me. He was sleeping in the bathtub, I believe, because I snored so much that I drove him out. I drove him into the bathtub. So he checked. We, I said, "Well, you need a separate room." So after that, we had three rooms. 
Rick had one, I had one, and Pat and Jerry had one. Really? Yeah. yeah. And that was after you that. You had the I snoring we, room. I, yeah, I had the snoring room, I guess. But it, it turned the corner after that. I, karma, though, I end up ruined with Dave Miloff, who snored worse than anybody I ever met. <laughs> so bad, in fact, that I almost wish he died a couple times. <laughs> He quit breathing. And I didn't know. Should I hit him with the pillow or just let him go? <laughs> then I realized I need a sweeper in the morning. So whack. Yeah, I better wake him up. So, but there was, uh, yeah, it was other oddities, oddities of, of the curling life. The younger we were, the stranger the stories were. So I, you're right, though. As we got a little older, we matured a little bit. Maybe it makes the smarter decision when the, mo- the moments still occur, that, that moment of, could this happen or could that happen? Oh yeah. And then you've just you've had enough years of experience to go, no, you know what? Eh, we could we could just head back to the room now. That's probably yeah. a better idea. Yeah, there was times when the team wasn't unanimous in that, especially the team I, I started skipping after ninety seven. There was there was times when the front end the younger went, guys, yeah. went totally the other direction than the older guys. <laughs> so well, I shouldn't say the older guys. Let's go with me and Bob being the mature ones and the other two going their own way once in a while. Normally not till we're out of a boss below, to to their credit. So the, the, that was all fine. Yeah, I think there's a there's a short Short list of guys that can really uh, sleep very little and drink very hard and win the bond spiel. And I mean, that's a, a, a badge of honor that I don't think anybody really wears anymore. It's just, you can't. But, I don't think uh, they do anymore. Back, back when, back in the late seventies and early eighties, yeah, you could, was, when we played Paul a couple of times, I know both teams have stayed up quite late. And uh, <laughs> well, would Paul actually try to stay up with you? It would with, party with you guys. Yeah. With Galson? It's whether or not you could keep up with him. Would he intentionally come out and try to come to your room or like uh, party with you, you know, with the, with the well, opponent? You or? Remember, the times I remember is when Glenn was already playing for me and he had a different team. So they were mm-hmm. buddies. And yeah, so we ended up being a couple of times when we probably, uh, our enthusiasm for the party was probably uh, overshadowed the curling a little bit. But yeah, it always worked out. Yeah, it was fun. It looks like the little hamster's still spinning in your well, I, I, I'm, trying, I'm trying to think of ones I can tell, not ones I can't. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, I mean, okay. Well, what else? There's got to be, uh, okay, ever any uh, fist fights on the ice or anything like that? Or anything, anyone go to blows that you remember, either on your game or no? We, 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 were, opponents or? we were past. Yeah. Fists, yeah. <laughs> I was ever a fighter. Why would I start? Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, I don't know. It was, it was a lot of fun. It was a mm-hmm. great time. You know, I, I, I miss... I'll always miss the competitive side of it, but I'll miss the people side of it just as much. So that kind of game. This was great. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah, you know, that's great. Hopefully, you got something you can use out of that. Uh, if I can only remember if it was all the truth or not. Oh, <laughs> oh there. <laughs> you know, there is one other kind of story because I can always edit it later. Once yeah. you tell it, we can always edit it. Later. Okay. Well, I ended up playing Bernie a couple times in other events, and I had quite a reputation. After you played with him, yeah. Yeah, after I played with him. And we went out to Calgary one year to play in, uh, I can't remember what the event was, but Glenn was playing with me and Rob and, and Ron, and uh, we had uh, a fairly big reputation for slow play under old rules. So figure that out. So we're all playing. Uh, like we the blonde up, slow or not that slow? Like that's because oh, Claire well, was a whole I'd, other I'd level. I'd say right? probably not quite Claire. Yeah. If you ever Claire remember was, playing Claire, did you ever get a chance? You probably oh, played, I played him. him yeah. I played him. Well, we played him in 70, we played him in 76 prior. And, and he was the same way? 13 yeah. as he was forever. So was Gary as bad? Probably. It was hard to tell. Uh, Claire was kind of <laughs> dominant. But anyway, uh, so we're playing and uh, we're playing against Bernie. And we've, I can't remember if it's before or after we beat him for the cars in, in Vernon, probably after. And uh, we're having this uh, this game, and I'm getting slower and slower, and we're playing along. And Are you doing it intentionally? Or? Well, not yet, but this is where it gets interesting. Okay, so he's been setting this trap for a while. So we're out there, and me and Glenn and uh, I guess Robert discussing something because Ronnie never he, he always just said, "Well, whatever you guys you know, do, it's fine." And we're talking about this shot, and the next thing I. I I turn around and we're facing the far end. I turn around and two of them have got a backgammon board out and they're rolling dice. This is Sparks team. And Bernie's got the paper out and he's reading the newspaper. And I turn around, I look at him and says, you think this was slow? (laughs) (laughs) But we were killing ourselves laughing. He had made his point. (laughs) And we, uh, yeah. So he would say I was the forerunner of one of the forerunners of slow play. Uh, uh, Clocks would have been helpful, I guess. Mm -hmm, But mm -hmm. but I I never was a fast player. So I guess kind of, hang with that but that would have been a good picture if a guy could have got that <laughs> two of them playing backgammon and one reading the paper while we're trying to make a decision well probably with two rocks in play mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but who would remember <laughs> yeah that's the last clean one I yeah the last clean oh come yeah. on there's, there's yeah, there more, was but, a few yeah. Yeah. post spiel parties best left open well, and so playing with Bob then, what did you, so how about uh, the old man then did you did Jim sort of uh, Jimmy was our coach hang out did he okay, he was our coach well, in yeah. one yeah. yeah yeah it was kind of funny there because there was yeah. we almost 
we weren't going very good the first couple of spiels, and there was the talk of maybe letting Bobby skip for a while, and I'd play third just to sort out what was going on. And then we went on this little team walk, and the front end said, not a chance. <laughs> We're not changing the lineup. <laughs> oh, okay. And then kind of once that was all put behind us, that's what we really started to play well that year. You know, well, you sort things out, right? It's good. It was good. But I love Jim. What a great guy. What a gentleman. Good, good player. Oh, that's good. Uh, like I said, if you think of more, Bert, I can always, I'll put you on a phone call. And we'll, right. we'll, I mean, I, there's obviously there's more somewhere along the way. Always line, more. That's the point of this is to get is as many of the good ones I can. There's some good stuff yeah. in there. I mean, there's uh, obviously, uh, there's good Bob the Cop stories, but we can't really tell those either. Bob so. the Cop? Who's Bob the Cop? Ursa, you know, RCMP. How come you can always get your flight changed? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <Well. laughs> yeah. So it's uh, yeah. interesting stuff, but yeah, I mean, I can't. I can't think of anything, uh, anything but good things to say about all the guys I played with over time. So it's it, which and is even nice. if you couldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't say it. Well, <laughs> but no, I, I really, I really, I can't, I can't say anything. I mean, uh, they, some of them might say the odd bad thing about me from the late seventies or whatever, but you know, I was growing then. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was great. 